Okay, we'll open up a public hearing. Um, for everyone in the room, and I realize there's a lot of people who come to this that are interested in what's happening in this building. Um, I, I cannot emphasize enough that this is the Commerce Committee who's seeing this bill for the second time. The Labor Committee has already passed the bill, it passed the House. It is here for a very narrow purpose that this is the insurance committee dealing with business. So I would ask anyone, when your testimony, if you have any sections in there about how important this is to, you know, to, to employees, I would ask you to scratch that from your testimony. Because we have a tremendous amount of cards, and that is really not what the debate is right now. The discussion in this committee is, is this an viable insurance product and is this appropriate for businesses to have to have this product? That's what we want to focus in on. Okay? With that, I will open up our testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, members of the uh, House Commerce Committee. Good morning. For the record, I'm Mary Stewart Guile, and I represent Merrimack District 7, which is Concord's uh, Wards 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7. I am the prime sponsor of House Bill 628, and I am here to ask for your support. I also serve as the chair of the Legislative Task Force on Work and Family, which was enacted in Chapter Law in 2007 and in statute uh, as RSA 276 for the laws of 2010. I mention that because throughout my testimony, I use the word we, and I am wanting to uh, assure you that the we represents myself and the task force on Work and Family. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, to have, for allowing me to have Senator Feltis here because he has been actively involved, more so than I, uh, with the development of this bill. I would like to just do a brief introduction, uh, talk about some general points, and then the benefits of this bill, particularly to the business community, based on the research that has been done in those states where it is already in operation. But I need to tell you the story about how it got here. House Bill 628 has been introduced to committees in this legislature in several forms since the year 2000. In 2007, the task force was enacted. One year later, in 2008, we held a summit for approximately 300 people and heard loud, loud and clear that it was time for New Hampshire to introduce paid family leave insurance. House Bill 661 was introduced in 2009 legislative session, assigned to the House Commerce Committee, studied extensively, and finally voted interim study. You know, when a bill is sent to interim study, it can come out with only two things. One, that it is recommended for future legislation. Two, it is not recommended for future legislation. House Bill 661 was recommended for future legislation by the Commerce Committee contingent on doing a very thorough actuarial study and analysis to determine how much would it cost, what employees were willing to pay to sustain a pool, and was there any interest among New Hampshire workers and employers to have such a benefit. Fulfilling the request of the 2010 House Commerce Committee took six years for the task force. We started with state agencies and we were told the usual story. They don't do this kind of thing, they're under resourced they don't have enough employees to assign this task to blah, blah, blah. We went to the people that have funds, uh, the Charitable Foundation and other places. They, don't, they, they didn't really think that this was something that they wanted to get into. Finally, in the fall of 2000, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the spring of 2015, we learned of funds available through the U.S. Department of Labor. We contacted the New Hampshire Department of Employment Security and asked if they would be willing to work with the task force members to submit a proposal. The proposal was available, or the application was for those states who had already done some work in the area of paid family medical leave. So they did. And in the fall of 2015, we were informed that an award of $173,000 had been granted to New Hampshire DES to do the study and cost analysis. Dr. Kristen Smith of the UNH Carson School of Social Policy was contracted to do the work, the results of which you will hear shortly. 
House Bill 628 was filed in the fall of 2016 based on all the work that had been done previously, introduced in the House in January 2017, assigned to the House Labor, Industrial and Rehabilitation Committee, and you know the rest of the story. As proposed, the uh, family medical leave benefit will, that we are proposing will be administered by DES and it is crafted to be employer friendly, as employer friendly as possible. <coughs> the basic components of the bill are aligned with statutes already in place in the unemployment insurance law. And for businesses over 50 with the requirements of FMLA. So that employers already deal with the statutes relative to unemployment insurance and they already are, and for those companies that have 50 or more employees, they're already dealing with the requirements of FMLA. We didn't want to, or, uh, to add anything new if we could avoid it, so we tried to align everything. You know what the general elements of the bill are, I'm sure. Employers will offer paid family leave as a benefit to all employees and collect payments from employees to send to DES. I'm not going to get into the uh, aspects of the bill because there are so many people here who want to testify and who will be touching on different parts of the bill, plus which you heard the debate in the House. Uh, you know that it relies on employee participation. You know, uh, you heard that it would uh, require 0.5 of weekly wages. All of the figures that you heard in the labor discussion and in the House discussion were as a result of the actuarial study. Um, and then what was perhaps as clear in the testimony is that the bill was amended to include an advisory council within uh, the Department of Employment Security to provide oversight of the bill from the moment that the bill passes, we hope, and to monitor all the steps, and to monitor and evaluate the steps of implementation. So the, it was very clearly laid out uh, as to what would happen once the bill was uh, assigned to DES, and fortunately they agreed to be the administrative agency. The benefits, and I'm just going to hit now up on the benefits to employers based on the research. As some of you already heard, Family medical leave exists in the states of California, New Jersey, Hawaii, Rhode Island, most of the countries in Europe, most of the countries in South America, most of the countries in Asia, in various forms. All right, as of January 1st, we can add Washington State, Washington, D.C., and the state of New York. And in a matter of one year, we're going to see family medical leave all around us, in Vermont, in Connecticut, and in other, in, in other states as well. It is uh, something that states are implementing because as a benefit, they know that it will attract workers. The um, positive effects based on research that has been done on those countries, na on those states, I'm sorry, national polls, um, the uh, American in uh, Enterprise Institute, which is one of your most conservative think tanks in Washington, uh, the research shows that the positive effects on employee recruitment, this is from employers, this bill has had positive effects on employee recruitment, retention, reduced turnover, improved morale, and employee performance, productivity, and profitability. Joe Keith, who is CEO of Pax World, which is a company of 49 employees located in, I think, Dover, Rochester, wrote in the November 11th issue of New Hampshire Business Review, he listed what his employees said about working in his company. It makes us a better team. It makes us more productive. It makes us more loyal. It makes us for stronger morale. It's why we love working here. We appreciate how much our company cares for our families. Nationally, the research um, focused on California because California, the uh, Family Medical Leave was enacted in 2009. So it's been in place there longer than it's been in any other state. In that time, the state has seen a 14% increase in labor force participation since the legislation was enacted. When you think of what some of our needs are here in New Hampshire, that is a very significant finding. Also, 87% of employers reported no added costs due to paid family leave, and 9% reported cost savings. National polls from the groups that I mentioned earlier found that in 2013, 
45% of small business owners supported proposals to create a publicly administered paid family leave program. In 2017, that number has grown to 70%, 70. National polls also found that 70% of those who voted for President Trump and 85% of those who voted for Hillary Clinton support paid family leave. And we know that our president and his daughter in particular are, um, are supportive of this, of this benefit. So I, when you um, ask why are we doing this now, I would ask you to read the finding statements to the bill. We know that there is a critical shortage of educated and skilled workers in the <coughs> We know, and you heard it on Wednesday on the floor, that the Governor's Task Force on Millennials have asked for family-friendly benefits to be available for Millennials in New Hampshire. And we know that our demographics are very seriously down right now. We know that as a state, our birth rate needs to be 2.1 to replace itself. We know that our birth rate is 1.9. We have a lot of problems. We export 60% of our high school students to other states for jobs and education. We export 40% of our college graduates. We need to find <coughs> ways to bring our people back into New Hampshire to support our economy. And the American Institute, I'm sorry, the American Enterprise Institute found that as a result of family medical leave, there is less dependence on government subsidies. This was a very significant finding because it keeps people off welfare. They also found that there was continued and increased consumer spending, the usual things. So it proposes, House Bill, in closing, House Bill 628 proposes a benefit that is comprehensive and specific in addressing serious family and medical needs. It is accessible to all employees. It's a choice. Affordable, cost-effective, inclusive, and available without adverse employment consequences. Its intent is to promote financial support <coughs> for all of our New Hampshire working families to attract, support, and retain a talented and skilled workforce, and in my view, is essential for a strong and growing New Hampshire econ economy. I ask you to support the Labor's Committee, Labor Committee's bipartisan vote of 13 to 6 ought to pass as amended, and the New Hampshire House's bipartisan vote of 183 to 51 ought to pass as amended, and I thank you for listening. Thank you. And we're all <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Dan Feltus, Senate District 15, Concord, Hopkinton, Henniker, uh, Warner, and Pennecook. It's an honor to be before uh, your committee, Mr. Chairman, and House Commerce with my colleague and friend, Representative Guile, to present for your consideration House Bill 628. Uh, this is, as been noted, a bipartisan bill with bipartisan work all along through House Labor, through the floor, and through this committee. Recognizing that if you're a worker with a new kid, like me, a new <laughs> child, a baby, <coughs> or you have a parent or grandparent that you need a caregive for, or maybe you have a child with severe and persistent disabilities that you need to spend time with from time to time, or maybe yourself, maybe you have an illness, maybe you've been afflicted with cancer and you need treatment. Maybe you're struggling with opioids and you need to get in treatment. To not risk your entire family's economic <coughs> security, simply for those basic reasons, to not have to choose between work and family. We value both and we should value the proposition that both are attainable. That's what this bill is all about. If we're serious about combating the opioid epidemic, Mr. Chairman, we move forward with family and medical leave insurance to allow people the prospect of spending time in treatment without risking their economic livelihood. That's one of the major reasons people don't get treatment. It's because they can't afford to leave their job to get into treatment. If we're serious about attracting and retaining a high quality skilled workforce, we finally move forward with family leave, Mr. Chairman. We finally do it. And that's just not me and Representative Giles speaking, that's more than 100 New Hampshire businesses have signed on to a letter in support of House Bill 628, recognizing the need to attract and retain a young, high-quality, skilled workforce, demographically and economically needed. 
And it's a recognition, Mr. Chairman, of all the work that we've done with the business community for years on this bill. This bill wasn't whipped up before a hearing in House Labor. This bill's been worked on for years, including with the business community. And let me just highlight a few things that have been incorporated in this bill, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, based on the input and the feedback from the business community. First, flexibility in how the leave insurance payment is paid. Businesses said, you know what? How about give us the flexibility to pay it on behalf of our workers as a marketing tool potentially for those workers to come work for us. So businesses can pay it on behalf of their workers <coughs> or they can withdraw or deduct from the workers' paycheck. Second, it's aligned almost as best as you can with the unemployment insurance system. It piggybacks off the unemployment insurance system, something every business is familiar with. You make your quarterly payments, you're going to be making your quarterly payments in the same vein uh, with FMLI premium payments. The piggybacks off an existing <laughs> system, an existing mandate. The handling and the processes of claims, piggybacking. Definitionally, as best as possible, piggybacking off of unemployment insurance. Third, job protection. Representative uh, Gal alluded to it. I think it's important to mention for businesses with less than 50 employees they do not have to keep that job open or offer a substantially equivalent position upon a return from leave that's not in there that's a misnomer that we've heard it's not in the bill uh, in fact we responded to the business community by not putting it in the bill um, notice Advance notice of a leave, if at all practical, is in the bill to uh, businesses. And employers can opt out. Employers can opt out if they demonstrate they're providing a substantially equivalent package of benefits, either on their own or through the private market. There's been this notion that the private market is out there providing these kind of benefits. And after all of the research and all of the discussions, I can tell you, for the benefits in here, that's not true. There's some short-term disability plans out there, yes. Maybe there's some long-term, too. But do they cover opioid treatment? We heard no. Do they cover new children? No. Do they cover caregiving, including for a kid with disabilities? No. That's what we've heard after years of work on this. So employers can opt out if they make that presentation. If they don't opt out and they choose to deduct uh, from an employee's check, that worker can opt out before employment commences. So there's two opt-outs here, which has led to some uh, debate and discussion about the financial solvency, if you will of this plan. I, hear, I think you'll see presentation from Employment Security that basically says that if the FMLI uh, percentage were 0.67% rather than 0.5%, in their view, it would definitely be solved, without a doubt. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of that. I'm sure they will. But I think their estimates are very <coughs> conservative about what's needed. Uh, I think there is, in the processing of FMLI payments, less dispute as unemployment insurance, less paperwork as unemployment insurance, and because there's less dispute and less complexity, there'll be less appeals as unemployment insurance. Uh, you know, when an employer fires somebody and it's a question of over misconduct or not to disqualify from unemployment insurance, that can be pretty contentious and involve <laughs> a lot of witnesses and that kind of thing, when a worker has a new baby, um, that's not very contentious. You're not going to be disputing whether or not the worker had a child. I mean, maybe. So I think the estimates, Mr. Chairman, of the department are pretty conservative about uh, the amount of money that they need under this circumstance. So I think even 0.67 percent is, in my view, high. But regardless of the debate over the finances, 
this committee or House Finance can do what was debated all along, which is whether or not to authorize the department the ability to make an adjustment, a modest adjustment, up or down from the 0.5%. So this committee could do, set it at 0.5%, but give the department the authority to set it between 0.25%, adjust it down, or 0.75%, adjust it up, if it so merits doing so. That's been discussed. That's a reasonable proposal. And all of your questions about solvency are handled right there. So is there precedent for this? Yes, there is. In unemployment insurance, the commissioner has the ability, uh, there's different surcharges, there's, there's 2.5% surcharges that the commissioner has the authority over already in unemployment insurance. So, and, you know, I don't think it's unreasonable to consider a one quarter percent up or down ability or discretion of the commissioner if, in fact, this committee's concern is so called solvency. So that's that issue. I can tell you one thing that will certainly impair solvency is uh, going from opt out and opt out to opt in and opt in. That's going to really hamper solvency. Um, so, employer opt in employee opt-in, especially employer opt-in, in my view, will really hamper solvency. So right now, you have the ability as a committee to put a band there. Set it at 0.5%, put a band between 0.25% and 0.75%, and that handles those questions. In conclusion, again, I just want to uh, thank Representative Guile for all her work and leadership on this, this committee for all your time. Um, I think this is a real opportunity for New Hampshire to not just respond to the voters, I and mean, Representative Guile talked about that. 82% of Grand Sayers support this, Republican, Democrat, Independent, wide support. Not just respond to the voters, but do something that can put New Hampshire on the map. Make us attract and retain the kind of high quality skilled workforce of tomorrow that is demographically and economically needed. We know it. We can do it with this. Let's put this in place as a critical piece to combating the opioid epidemic. And let's put this in place as a critical piece to help our families with children with disabilities. Giving them the opportunity uh, to spend some time when that child may have uh, serious medical issues to attend to without risking that family's economic livelihood. That's what this is all about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we will be happy to answer any questions. Okay, so uh, yes, we have Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions I can to One is just more of a request. Um, I appreciate the historical uh, background from Representative Brown. Would you be comfortable sending the committee a, a written copy of your testimony? Yeah. Okay. I never give it out before because I'm a teacher. I don't want to read it. Thank you. Uh, my other question, and for those of you that Senator Feldman <coughs> touched upon this, um, my question is, so which employers reading through this would be obligated to carry this? You said that, if I heard correctly, that employer businesses with under 50 employees would not need to carry this, and I, I'm not sure if that's really clear. If you could clarify uh, for us. Yeah, sorry about that, uh, Representative, if I, if I wasn't clear about that. Uh, the, the, so the job protection piece is not, is just, is not changed in this bill. In other words, this bill is all about family medical leave insurance. It doesn't provide any additional protections in terms of your job, getting your job back after an leave. It's just a default to FMLA. So if you have more than 50 employees, <coughs> you're required, if there's a qualifying leave under FMLA, the federal law, uh, to provide that employee their job back, a substantially equivalent job, basically. That job protection piece is not extended down underneath 50 employees for employers with less than 50 employees. Um, the leave part is still there for all covered employers. In other words, so if the employee is eligible, uh, if it's a covered employer, um, you know that that particular employee can take a leave and get the 
temporary wage replacement insurance, but does not guarantee their job back. Question. And my, my other question is, so people have asked, and I see on uh, line 14 of page 2, this chapter applies to all non-governmental employees, so um, I was wondering if you could go into more detail as to why uh, governmental employees are would be exempt from this. Thank, thank you, Representative. Uh, so we are. Representative. Pretty yes. name. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so this is what other states do, and in part the thinking is because of collective bargaining agreements and, and public sector work, workers and all the rules that apply, that it's better to set it up this way as a first step, and then if, for example, uh, the collective bargaining unit ratifies something like this, then they can apply to be in the pool if they wanted to uh, for, pub for public units. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, Representative Williams has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for presenting to us. Um, since we, we're supposed to address the, the, the actuarial side of things, the costs, um, I'm curious as to your impression of the administrative costs that it, uh, the fiscal note in this bill implies and whether or not you had the opportunity to look at, at the administrative cost in other states that have done similar things. Um, just in my in, uh, cursory look, it seems a little expensive. Uh, Re Representative uh, uh, Williams, uh, I think that in terms of the, the administrative cost, it's in the ballpark of other states. However, it's a bit high. And if I were Employment Security, I probably would draft it high too to make sure that you know we have the employees and we're we're covering it and that kind of thing. The reality is, though, that as I said, the per uh, UI claim, unemployment insurance claim, is a lot less more expensive than a per FMLI claim because this is less complicated, less paperwork, and it's going to need less people per claim. So I think that, you know, I, I understand our respect for the, the departments coming from on it. I, I think it's high. Um, that being said, even with their estimate of what they think they need to accomplish this, um, even going to 0.67% covers it, even in the opt-out situations. So that's why I'm suggesting, while there may be a lot of discussion and debate about this employee, this claims adjudicator, this, that, the other thing. The reality is, is if this committee chose to give the department the discretion to make an adjustment up or down as it saw fit and its fiduciary responsibility of managing this pool of 0.25%. So going from 0.25% to 0.75%, uh, you're covered. So. Okay, so we're going to Okay, great. Quick question for you. Thank you very much for coming. So I understand the Family and Medical Leave Act, and I'm trying to understand the difference between that and this bill. So, um, you know, so it sounds like every employer in the state, including possibly self-employed individuals, would be covered under this and be forced to participate. And then the question is, who would be covered under the Family and Medical Leave Act? Grandparents, for example, are not included but it sounds like they are in this bill. Can you kind of sift out the difference between this and the Family Medical Leave Act? We can try. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the the uh, question of grandparents was uh, something that we debated, uh, and we felt that if it was, as the bill progressed through the various committees, if it was the um, persuasion of the Labor Committee, or in this case, the Commerce Committee, to amend the requirements, we, we went with the FMLA. Uh, requirements and but if if, if this committee uh, were to feel that grandparents should be involved because we know that 10,000 grandparents are looking after okay, their so children. they're not included. Not I, saw that I don't think so. Are they? I, I, I just and what was the second part of your question? So, so if you, so they are. In, I'm sorry, Representative Sandler. They are included. They are included. I, my bill is back here somewhere, and I can't. So, so that goes beyond the family medical. Yes, yes, it does. 
That's so just make sure I understand. What are we talking about include? Included as so that's the person that's taking care of the sick? Yes. Or yes. a person as the, the grandparent can get The leave. Federal Family Medical Leave Act allows you to apply for a leave to take care of your in child. Yeah, or, okay. Not your in-laws, not your grandparents. Not your grandparents. So this extends that's right. quite okay. a bit beyond that's what is a current law. Got it. I think. So, okay. That's what I'm trying to understand. <laughs> Representative Sanford, to ask you to answer your, your first, the first part of your question in terms of self-employed. Self-employed, uh, uh, business owners uh, are exempt to the extent they're exempt under unemployment insurance. So, so that is, that statute. right, exactly. So it's aligned uh, with that. However, if you are a self, you are exempt self-employed <coughs> business owner and you wanted to get into the fund, you could. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, both very much for your testimony this morning. Um, uh, I think this, this this question goes to either one of you, but Senator Feltus, you mentioned that um, that over a hundred um, uh, employers had signed a letter in support of uh, uh, of uh, the Family Medical Leave um, uh, Insurance Act, and um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether or not, um, and this is a multi-part question, so I'm going to ask it once, um, whether whether or not any any employers. Are, are currently providing, um, uh, I, I, I guess, this type of uh, program on their own and uh, why they might be doing that uh, on their own and, um, and, and how this uh, would, I guess, extend and, and impact small businesses. So, uh, Representative Luno, uh, thank you for the question. Appreciate it. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and I know Representative Guile will, will add on. So. Yes, there are some businesses that are providing benefits akin to what's in this chapter. Those businesses, by and large, are bigger businesses, larger businesses, which as the Commerce Committee knows in terms of setting up a pool, an insurance pool, if you're self-insured or whatever, uh, you can do. You have a better ability to do it if you're a bigger, larger business. Smaller to mid-sized businesses, by and large, don't have an ability to do that because they don't have as many workers, they don't have as much ability to do it. Uh, and that's what we've heard from small and mid-sized businesses, and I appreciate the question, is being part of the bigger pool where, we, where the costs are spread, uh, administrative costs are down, it's a cost-effective way to piggyback off of unemployment insurance. We appreciate that opportunity, and you know what? It's going to make us more competitive with these bigger businesses and attracting and retaining the kind of workforce we need uh, to get the job done. So that's what we've heard. Uh, certainly there's a lot of small, medium-sized businesses that are supporting <coughs> us across New Hampshire, uh, many of which are on that letter. Jay. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to give you some of the businesses that are already doing it. Real quick, Gage. Oh, well, in terms of we, yeah, I'm it, sorry. Are you? This is a handout that. that well, I, yes, and I, I just over the past we couple just of don't years. Have a lot of time. I know, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry, but this is such an important bill. Um, the the small businesses and large businesses. Uh, uh, have really signed on to this bill. And those of you that just, I'm not going to read it, those of you that received this handout noticed that at the bottom we have some of the major businesses in New Hampshire that have signed on to this bill. But also small businesses, for example, Brad Sauer, who owns Oxman Builders. He was, re he was written about in this past week's New Hampshire Business <coughs> Review. He said he would love to offer family medical leave, but he, as an employer, cannot afford it. So he really would like the state to take on this problem, this, this program, and he would like to be able to offer it to his employees. And he is also a quoter. Okay, now representative. Uh, you said caregivers are not in included in the other insurances or not in this? Um, thank you for the question, Representative Gage. So uh, I think you're referring to FMLA. Is, are you ref well? Eh, I'm not sure, but um, <coughs> caregiver. If you have a child with disabilities or illnesses, or you have a a parent or grandparent that has impairments and 
uh, you need to spend time with them. Uh, they're covered under this family medical leave insurance program. Um, and so that's covered. Um, so we have an aging population. A lot of our parents and grandparents, um, some of which are, are aging in place, and that's certainly a preference, and to, to spend time with them and to care give for them. Um, and quite frankly, in many cases, spend time with a loved one when they're a dying or about to die um, without risking your family's economic livelihood. That's a key component of this. Thank you very much, and Thank I think you. everybody should have it. But, uh, Representative Butler has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first off, I should disclose I'm a small business owner. And uh, secondly, does this cover both full-time and part-time employees? Yes, yes. on a pro-regular basis. Yes. On a pro-regular yes. basis. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And thank you for your patience, Mr. Chair. Well, thank well, you very much. It will be Okay. Uh, we have a tradition that we always uh, allow a senator uh, to testify, so Mary Martha will try to support the bill. And all I can ask is that Martha is not to repeat the quality of the well, thank you very much, Chairman Hunt and members of the Commerce Committee. It's nice to be back here after several years when I served on this committee. Uh, I am um, the Senator for District 21, which is the city of Portsmouth and six Inland Seacoast communities, which consist of Newington, Newfields, Newmarket, Lee, Manbury, and Durham. And I appear before you today in support, in very strong support, of this extremely important piece of legislation. And I understand from um, Chairman Hunt that what you're really interested in here is looking at, is this a viable insurance product? And you've heard all of the broad reasons for why we need to pass this bill, particularly at a time when this state is wrestling with um, a workforce crisis and how we need to bring young people um, into the state and that we need to be competitive with our neighbors, uh, and that this is a very um, significant program that would allow us to do that. I would urge you to take the time to review the actual area study that came from Dr. Kristen Smith um, under the Carsey Institute, um, which really became the mechanism for determining um, the viable elements in this program to make it sustainable. And uh, that's what's really important. And most of the other states that you've heard about do not have an opt out. It's mandated. We know in New Hampshire that we don't like mandates. So that is not in our bill. That makes it somewhat different, okay? Um, because it's a little bit harder to guarantee um, the viability. That's why it's also critical to provide the department with the opportunity to have some flexibility in determining actually what the pay-in on a weekly basis should be. And you heard many times from Senator Feltus um, that it could be lower and it could be higher as much as 6.7. Um, so that is something I think that you need to take under consideration <coughs> is how to package that going forward. Uh, but this has been very, very carefully and meticulously crafted over a, a considerable amount of time. Um, and so I think it's really focusing in on those technical issues that have to do with its viability that's important before this committee. You've heard how it is a benefit to employers as well as employees. I think one of the things too often is that people hear this referred to as paid family and medical leave insurance. And then there's the feeling that we're saying that means that employers have to pay for this. There are some states that have involved both employers and employees in paying for this. This, in this bill, does not require any payment 
from employers unless they wish to pay in to the program, as you heard, by, by paying for their employees. Uh, so that's an important difference. However, if you were to change that to an opt-in, the difficulty would be that um, it's much more difficult to be able to do the education piece to get employees to understand why this is so beneficial to them. And yes, it does go beyond the Family and Medical Leave Act in Washington by a broader coverage because we are an aging state. We do have many um, elderly individuals here and we want to make sure that while people are working, they still have the option to look after significant family members. You know, so that, you know, but that's also part of most of the other bills that have passed or programs that have passed in other states. You heard that for California, they saw over the period of time from 2009, that it did not result in any additional cost to businesses. So that's another piece that you may want to make sure um, is, uh, but it's been structured in such a way so that it won't. Um, and uh, I think that having advanced notice um, is an important piece for the employer so that they can plan. And oftentimes, even though the amount of time that an employee can take, uh, the studies have shown that oftentimes they don't take that full amount of time. They may just want a couple of weeks. And so that changes a little bit the impact in terms of viability. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, stress why it's an opt-out, why it's not an opt-in, um, how it has been really gone through with a fine-tooth comb, and what are still the variables that your committee should be looking at. And I would say to you, this is not a partisan issue. But I was quite disturbed to look at the vote that came out of the floor of the House and to see that for your committee, it is a partisan issue. And I hope those of you who could not bring yourselves to vote for this last Wednesday will be able to raise the questions that you have about this program and get them answered so that we can move forward in a bipartisan way um, to put something in place it has enormous significance for our ability to be competitive in the workplace. Those are my comments, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you again. No, no questions. <coughs> Those questions are Representative Stephen Schmidt, Chairman of the House Labor Committee, with opposition to the government. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and honorable members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Steve Schmidt. I represent Carroll County 6 in uh, the Bullboro, and I also chair the Labor Committee. Uh, we've had exhaustive studies on this bill in labor, uh, subcommittee, countless hours. And uh, again, it did pass out of our committee with some uh, Republican support. Uh, protocol prevented me from taking the floor of the House to discuss some of the issues, but uh, I did reserve my prerogative to comment a little bit today, so uh, I thank you for hearing me. The bill before you, uh, conceptually, the, the issue of family leave is, is something I'm not here to argue pro or con about. Uh, I don't think that's it. I am here to uh, that the bill that you have in front of you is flawed on so many different levels that frankly we think it's, it's just not workable. Let me start with the opt-out provisions of this bill, which is unique <coughs> to the New Hampshire uh, bill that's submitted. What the opt-out says is that every employee will have an opportunity to opt out of this, and they will have the opportunity to opt out of this by downloading a form from the department indicating their preference, and they have to submit this form back to the employer and the department, and it has to be notarized. Now, I would suspect that a number of our New Hampshire employees 
uh, probably don't even know what a notary public is or where to get it or that there's a fee involved in it. You know, that's just my take on that one. Also what the opt-out does, it's a one-time opt-out. If you opt out, you know, you're, you're not out-out, you know, you will have the opportunity to opt back in. So on the anniversary date, uh, you know, that we're talking about. If you look at the demographics of the state, we, we're looking at a universe of about 700,000 employees that would be impacted by this. And if you break down those demographic, demographics a little further, the majority, roughly 400,000, are in an age group of between 35, uh, getting close to 60, the, the prime working years. Uh, and I would suggest to you that these are the folks who would be most likely to opt out, simply because they're going to make a judgment that it's not in my best interest to do so. The half a percent opt-in is, is nowhere near what the other states have done. Uh, at a minimum, it's a 1% buy-in on the four states that have opted into this program so far. And actually, 1.2% in New York, uh, that's proposed. So there's a big difference in the, in the dollar amount. It's not quite linear when I say the opt-out. So let's say, as an example, that we have a 30 or a 40% opt-out. You know, if you grant the fact that the majority of our workers are pretty bright people and they make a judgment, that, well, why would I pay anything into this when I can opt into it on an annual basis? So let's assume, and that's what we assumed in the committee, a 30% drop rate at, at least. What that would do then is the remainder, in our opinion, was would probably increase the take rate because the folks that stayed in it would be more likely to take the program. And what the take rate is, is the universe of folks that are in the program, what is the annual take rate, those that would exercise the benefit in a given year. At the half a percent rate that was discussed, uh, this program fails at a take rate of about 6.1%. Anything over that, as the way this legislation is written, it fails. We had issues here, and I found it interesting to hear the sponsors. We delivered over the length of our deliberations about a page and a half concerns that we had with this bill. And not one of those concerns was brought back in, in with an amendment. So what basically you have in front of you is exactly what we had in front of us at the beginning, you know, regardless of, of, of where we were coming from on that issue. Uh, the issue of portability is not addressed in this legislation. So New Hampshire has a number of seasonal employees. So if they elect to participate, the question becomes when their employment terminates, so does their participation in the program. Even if they should get up another seasonal job in two months, they would have to opt back in again. But this legislation, again, does not address the issue of portability. Part-time workers are handicapped. Yes, can they theoretically benefit from this? Maybe, if they get enough time in, but probably not. Uh, these are just some of the issues that I just wanted to share with you, why I think that this legislation as presented to you is flawed. These issues need to be addressed. We spoke earlier about giving the department the ability to increase or decrease. We discussed that point exhaustively during our committee negotiations. Again, no amendment was brought forth. The legislation calls for the formation of a commission well, that's nice, but the commission has no teeth. The commission can report back to the legislature and make a recommendation to the legislature that we should increase the fees or decrease the fees or whatever. Uh, for any of you I would suggest who have been here for a while, you know the difficulty uh, in going down that particular road. Uh, basically, the ability to increase or decrease really should exists within the wording of the legislation, in my opinion. It does not. It, it, it's just going to lead to uh, uh, 
more issues than I think anyone would care to deal with. Uh, to deal with. Uh, so, so many other issues that, that we got into with this, and, and of course one of them was, you know, who can benefit. Uh, there was a the grandma and grandpa issue and, you know, going above and beyond the federal family leave. Uh, you know, if New Hampshire chooses to go down that road, I guess it's all right, but people need to have the understanding, really, of what that means in the terms and the number of people who would take that benefit. Let me close with just mentioning the 50 and under employer. The 50 and under employer are exempt under the Federal Family Leave Act. Under this legislation, they're not. However, an employee who pays in expecting a benefit, chooses to exercise the benefit, has the possibility of losing his or her job because they are not protected. Now, I would imagine that that could be uh, addressed in the legislation, but frankly, I think that's up to the sponsors. Uh, I think that would leave the department with a quandary of, do we grant family leave or do we grant them unemployment insurance or both? I guess we're going to have to find out about that. In closing, again, conceptually, we were all in favor of family leave. If it's properly drafted and addressed, we think it could be a good thing for New Hampshire. I want to emphasize here, I'm not here today to say that this is a terrible idea. I'm not. I'm here to suggest to you that the legislation you have in front of you has more holes in it than Swiss cheese, and it really needs to be addressed. Uh, I think it's unfortunate it got out of my committee the way it got out, but again, I'm just sharing my opinion. That concludes my remarks, Mr. Chairman. I'd be glad to take a question. Representative Kitch. If it came out of your committee, pause the both the Republicans and Democrats right across, why didn't anyone bring up any of the problems that you're mentioning? They were brought up exhaustively in the committee. They were brought up in the subcommittee, and they were also shared with the governor's office. Uh, they were also uh, on, on the House floor, if you listen to a couple of the uh, floor speeches that were opposed to the bill as written, uh, they were explored exhaustively. The concept of family leave is very popular, and people, I guess, were saying, you know, I'm going to overlook the flaws, and from a policy perspective, you know, we did. We had four Republicans said, let's go. I guess they figured, well, let commerce deal with it, or finance. I hope that answers your question. Uh, it sounds like you're mad at the Republicans. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I wouldn't go that far. Maybe he's a little disappointed. <laughs> Deeply disappointed. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, uh, Chair will call on Rep oh, Representative McBeth in support of the bill. I'm going to go with Anne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and my friends and colleagues. I will be brief. Um, I'm here representing the um, New Hampshire Legislative uh, Children's Caucus, which is a bipartisan, bicameral group of 50 of us members, and we invite you to join us. Um, I, since I can't paraphrase, this is a statement, I will eliminate four of the um, points that they have made based on the chairman's request that I stick only to the... Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so the Children's uh, Caucus's mission is to advocate for policy changes to ensure that all New Hampshire children reach their fullest potential. Um, they've endorsed um, HB 628 uh, because it established a family and medical leave insurance program which all which will provide temporary partial raise replacement to working people who need time off to care for themselves, their children, or their family members. Um, it is enabling legislation that will benefit all working families. It has a funding mechanism proposed is based on bipartisan collaborative effort. It is self-funding, non-distributive risk management application to meet unmet needs of working families that are currently not in the marketplace. Um, the employee uh, participation is voluntary and employers who offer it a comparable plan can opt out. Um, so the, the Children's Caucus encourages you all to support um, HB 628. Thank you.
And personally, I would add, and this is personal, not that there is a portability portion of the bill that employ employees part-time or full that pay into the program um, can carry their, um, their, the, their contributions with them when they change jobs, as well as if you're working two or three jobs and contributing, all of those will um, uh, go together. So, thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Representative Beth, for your testimony. Uh, just as you were um, wrapping up here, the final point, um, uh, whether it was portability or when. Uh, the the which, last one. And, um, and I think that it, that goes to the, 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 the um, Representative Chair uh, Schmidt's uh, uh, one of his concerns. I was wondering if you could add some light to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's me speaking as my experience with the bill, which perhaps there's others that come behind me, but I was just responding to the comment that it was not a portable program, which is important, and um, it actually is a portable program, so that if, um, if, you're particip if, you, if the employee opts to participate in it and they change jobs, um, that will follow them. The Department of Employment Security will follow whatever little fund that they paid in. Or if you're simultaneously, if you have two or three part-time jobs, which we know sometimes our working families do, uh, your, if you've opted in at all those jobs, they'll all um, co um, be collectively commingled together, and, and that will be what your benefit would be based on. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the record, my name is uh, Len Turcott, representing uh, Stratford District 4, which is the town of Barrington. I come before you today in opposition to this bill. Um, coming out of our committee, I was one of the majority of the Republicans on the committee that also uh, was uh, against the bill. Um, I'm not going to go over anything that is not fiscally related in deference to the chairman. Let me make sure I understand that. You said you, were, you supported the bill coming out of the committee? No, I was against it. I was okay. one of six who were against yeah. Did I say support? If I did, I didn't mean to. Sorry. I no, 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 no. You're right. Um, I will state of the financial aspects of it in my written testimony I'll hand out is uh, the key points from my floor speech the other day. Uh, as Chairman Schmidt said, there's just so many holes in this that it's it really needs a lot of work, but um, I, again, I will state today, and I came prepared to speak to just the financial aspects of this. On the House floor the other day, well, let, let's start with the, we keep hearing about the actuarial studies that have been done on this, and you keep hearing about a $5 uh, per pay period figure. I want you to understand that all the number crunching that has been done by the paid consultants on this required 100% mandatory participation of every employee in the state, including governmental employees. I'm going to read you some, some uh, passages from their, their reports themselves here in a moment, but what, bef what is before you now is an opt-in optional program of only private employers, still discounting all of the public employees. I, I'm going to say that it, uh, in a very kind way, the $5 estimate that you keep hearing about is very misleading. It's, it's going to be an impossible number uh, to maintain. Uh, we've heard, I've heard anecdotally from a couple people, including the sponsor of the amendment itself, that he pays nearly $60 a pay period for something of a less policy coverage than what, what is being proposed here. Um, we'll run, I'll run those numbers for you here in a moment. The other thing I mentioned on the House floor the other day was how this is kind of going to be a, very similar to an um, Obamacare or a Medicaid expansion or even a social social security type scheme. Um, it, it's just being advertised right now as something it, it, it cannot be sustainable financially. 
You remember when Obamacare was first uh, advertised, it was going to save individuals $2,500 a year on average, yet the pr premiums have quadrupled or more. Um, in Obamacare, you didn't even have to buy the insurance. You could pay the small pen penalty, so the healthy and the young, what did they do? They paid the penalty, or didn't, and then they waited to enroll until they needed. This is the scenario you're going to have with an opt-in system here. A shrinking pool of contributors into the insurance scheme causes the cost to go up. I mean, it's only, it's not magic, it's, it's actuarial math. And the, fa the fact is that human tendency is to use or overuse that which you pay for. Now, on the House floor, I mentioned um, a figure that somebody could pay into the system $240 while removing up to 5,000 benefits later. And in reviewing some of this material last night, I'm at, it's actually, I was a little bit off on that figure. Now I'm reading from material handed out by the Carsey Institute. This was testimony uh, by Kristen Smith, I believe. And there on the third page, they have a table. Now re again, recall, that all the actual aerial studies done, every figure that you're hearing is based on a 100% mandatory participation, not an opt-in, opt-out. They projected a, an employee earning $50,000 would have a yearly premium of $260 with a maximum program benefit of almost $7,000. How, with an opt-in system, how many years would an individual actually have to be in a program at $260 a year to take out $6,900? You're, you're talking over 20 years of premiums, or in this case the tax, to make up for it. It's just totally unsustainable. not going to talk about the, uh, oh, uh, Senator Feltis made a comment about, uh, and I haven't seen the new figures, these were not given to our committee, but he talked about a new uh, estimate that this was going to be now instead of 0.51 uh, or $5 a week that it looks like it's about $7.60 a week. As I mentioned before, somebody mentioned that they pay $60 a week for it now. Another individual I was speaking with pays $28 a week. Um, what's interesting is I, I don't know how you get to 0.76 because in the actuarial studies provided by Jeffrey Hayes, when they start talking about people starting to being able to opt out, his figure is already up to 0.86 and his estimates in my opinion, a little bit rosy. So what I'd like to do now, in closing, I just want to read you a few passages to kind of drive home some of these points. From, uh, again, from Kristen Smith's testimony to our committee. The policy parameters of paid family leave and medical leave insurance program described in HB 628 differ from the hypothetical model simulated in some important ways. One, 628 applies to all non-governmental employ employers where their simulations included every employee. And it goes on to say the simulated simulations included all workers, private, state, <coughs> local government and self-employed. I read to you the, ta uh, the table of uh, how much they pay in and how much they can take out at the end of the program. Again, this is in uh, 
Jeffrey Hayes' testimony, written testimony for the economic cost modeling in New Hampshire, the primary policy scenarios were selected by a subcommittee of task force, uh, task force on work and family, facilitated by Kristen Smith, Carsey Institute. The program would cover all types of workers, private, state, local, government, and self-employed. Again, with the mandate, 100% participation. From the same report, cautioning on the opt-in model. These analysis of programs with voluntary participation of workers should be considered exploratory. Voluntary program participation presents challenges for cost estimation given the current information on how workers might behave when choosing to pay into a social insurance fund. No family and medical leave programs currently in operation have a large degree of flexibility in worker participation. What that is saying is it's mandatory. So at the time, there are a few data available to corroborate the results or to gauge the accuracy of participation in the, the models. I spoke on the House floor about the 82% of employees in the state wanting it. I'm not going to repeat that. It's in my written testimony. But you, you may or will hear about the Granite State poll that was done asking employees if they were willing to pay $5 a week. Much like the 80% poll, yeah, who wouldn't? Yeah, sign me up. But what, again, I'll read here, the Granite State poll did not estimate the drop-off in voluntary particip participation at higher weekly program costs per worker. And the estimated levels, if, and the estimated levels are above the five-week cost in the survey question. So, basically, they didn't ask the, the people they talked to, they didn't say, hey, $5, okay, 65% of you say, yeah, what about 10? What about 15? What about 30? What about 40? What about 60, as one person I talked to? That poll number is going to go way down. And I believe with that, I will end my testimony. I don't believe that the majority of your committee, both Republicans and Democrats, believed it was a scheme. But my question to you is this. Did you say that one had to pay in $7,000 before you could take any money out? No. What I, what I said was that according to the research done by uh, Kristen Smith in the table, I can get you a copy if you would like. Again, everything you see, everything we were handled in Labor Committee was based on 100% mandatory participation. All the numbers you're hearing are based on mandatory participation. This here said an a yearly premium, calling it a premium, for somebody making $50,000 would be $260. Yet, after just less than a year of being in the program, somebody could pull out almost $6,900 in benefits. So my question in a voluntary system, most people are not going to sign up for this if they don't anticipate needing it. They will sign up when they know they need it. And at $260 a year for that one individual, how many years of premiums do you have to put into the system to take out $6,900. So in other words, take 6,900 divided by 260, whatever that is, and I think you're going to come up to a number somewhere in the mid-20 years worth of premiums just to cover that benefit. How is it possibly sustainable? If, excuse me, if somebody is paying $5 a week and they have a real problem, okay, isn't it worth are you saying it is 100%? You need 100% of the people to join this for it to work? If you are, I think they disagree with you. I'm saying the people who provided written testimony have said that, that you need a mandatory participation to work. Every state that currently has it has mandatory participation to work. Am I saying that it's not worth it? I'm not here to debate that. I'm here to debate with uh, Representative 
Hunt S does, and that's the financial viability. As this thing exists, it's financially unviable. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Ms. Okay. I appreciate it. Yes, uh, thank you uh, for your testimony. Um, it seems to me that a fundamental uh, principle of insurance is that uh, no one is required to have paid in premiums that represent 100% of the benefit. So that if someone uh, someone has uh, life insurance and dies in the you know the second month, they yes they do better, but 100% of the 100% of the people paying in are not going to die in the first month. Um, so I, I I think that you're taking an extreme position. Um, and, and, and my all right. So my, my question is: Are you not taking an inaccurate? Uh, you're taking a very inaccurate uh, position in talking about insurance because actuarial accounts already recognize that not everyone is going to be doing that. I, I would not characterize my testimony like that. No, I would not. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a couple more reps. I do like to hear from the Climate Security. Um, and then we're going to break for 20 minutes and they have the big piles of board against here. Uh, everybody else, they're not uh, involved in government. Uh, so just so everybody knows what, what the picture is. Okay, so Representative Mark uh, Pearson. Opposition to the bill. Thank for you those for people who are always wondering how we, we always have this tradition that we let. Senators first, representatives speak, and then the department, and that's just the way we Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Train. So, yes. Mr. Chair and fellow reps. I'm Representative Mark Pearson, uh, representing four towns in southern Rockingham County. I am also part-time CEO of a whole person wellness center in Kingston, bringing together family practice medicine, counseling services, massage, an extensive patient and community wellness education program. I'm very much in favor of helping our employees. I mean, to be against that is to be against <coughs> puppies and bunny rabbits. When difficulty strikes our employees, we have worked out various arrangements as needs have arisen. We do this for two reasons. Number one, we care for them as people, some of whom have been with us for years. But secondly, because good staff members are difficult to find, especially with unemployment being so low, we want to retain them. And I'm hearing now that other businesses wanting to keep good employees are also working out various <coughs> arrangements with their staff members facing this or that life situation. But the manner of helping employees outlined in this bill misses the mark, in my opinion. It's impersonal, it's one size fits all, it sets up a bureaucracy with yet more rules and regulations, and if you read the fiscal note, cost. And the employer's health cost of such an employee. So I think it gets an A-plus on compassion, as I hope what I do with my staff members gets, but I think it fails in method, and that is my testimony. Great, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Chair, Colin, uh, Jess, Representative uh, Jess Edwards. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, uh, I'm Representative Jess Edwards, representing Rockingham, Poor, Auburn, Chester, and Sandown. Uh, I'm, I'm here today um, not as much as a legislator as I am uh, as a uh, person who spent the last uh, dozen years of my career in privacy management. Uh, I uh, have for over a dozen years been a certified information privacy professional as certified by the International Association of Privacy Professionals. 
Uh, I worked uh, at a spinoff of Eastman Kodak uh, CareStream Medical Systems as the Global Director of Privacy and Product Security. So what I want to let you know is that um, I signed in that I'm opposed to the bill. What I'm really opposed to very specifically is uh, the way that the uh, phrase opt-in and opt-out have been used. Um, uh, quite, quite literally, um, as I advised our governance boards, our uh, product architecture boards, our marketing and HR boards, uh, this, the way that we have done it in this bill I think would be characterized by the Federal Trade Commission as a deceptive <laughs> practice. Uh, quite literally, a deceptive practice. And, and why is that? Generally, the preference in industry is to create true opt-in to any program. And if you have an opt-out, you have to make it a legitimate way to opt-out. So what does this bill do to um, delegitimize the way the opt-out is built? One, uh, at the beginning of the program, you can only do an opt-out at that point if you download the forms and go get a notary. If you want to opt-in, you don't have to go get a notary. So there's an additional burden placed on the person that wants nothing to happen relative to the person who wants to start having their payroll deducted. So, so, so that imbalance already begins to raise some questions. Then at that point, that person is no longer able to opt out of the program unless they quit or get fired. That's not, a, that's not an opt out any longer. And even if um, this legislature comes back and raises its fees from 0 0.5 to 0 0.86 to some other number, in other words, substantially changing the underlying contract that the person thinks that they're entering into, they still are not opted out. They're trapped in the system. And because of these things, um, this opt out uh, is, is really, in fact, not a true opt out. It would not pass industry standards. Uh, and, and I think as a state legislature, uh, it's our uh, obligation to uphold the highest in business, business ethics. And this does not meet the business ethics standard. So I would hope that the uh, committee would work on making this a true opt-out program. I think it would be uh, even better if it was a true opt-in program. Um, but but uh, I'll, I'll take it a little bit further. I mentioned how the Federal Trade Commission would probably consider this a deceptive use of the phrase opt-out. I would, and we're not governed by the FTC because we're the government, but, but, but it would if we were a private sector. It would also be considered to be unfair because um, we have the ability as the state to set up these rules that um, the private insurance companies cannot. We have an unfair competitive advantage in that regard, um, which I think will basically create an environment in which to the extent there are private insurance companies offering some form of FML now, they will be squeezed out of the market because they can't compete. Now, if, if I had a marketing manager come to me uh, and say, hey, look, I, I really um, don't want to have a true opt-in because it makes it harder to sell my product to our customer base, I would just say, I'm sorry, we have to behave in an ethical way in which we're not using unfair or deceptive business practices. That's just the way we behave. And I, I would like us to at least be as ethical as corporations. That's my goal. So, so if you would, if you would like to to work on the the opt-in opt-out proceeding or part of this, I'd be happy to work with a, a subcommittee to, to do that. If if you don't trust my testimony, uh, I would encourage that we get uh, Professor Robert Ford or Roger Ford from UNH's School of Law, who teaches privacy law over there. And I think everything I've said would be academically confirmed as being accurate. So with that, uh, I'll take questions if there are any. Representative Gidge has a question. Are you saying that you would pass this if people didn't have to have it notarized? No. No, I said that the entire... Uh, Okay, so I'm just focusing on the business in practices of opt-in, opt-out. Okay, you can answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I think this should be an opt-in. That's the ethical right. behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Any other? Thank you very much. No question. Thank you for your testimony. I just sure. have one really quick question, and that is: so, do we open ourselves up to uh, lawsuits, or do I mean, are you saying that this could be taken to court and challenged this whole I, bill? Or? I am not saying that. I got to warn you, I'm not an attorney. Okay. Well, I'm just I, wondering I, if I, we my are My expertise is in privacy law. I don't believe state governments are subject to the Federal Trade Commission. What I'm trying to say is that. If we were a private enterprise trying to implement an opt-in, opt-out program like this, we would be regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, and it would be ruled an unfair and deceptive trade practice, <coughs> and we would probably face some penalties for doing it. And I'm just saying that even though we're the state government and we don't have to do what the FTC would have us do, I think we have a duty to our citizens to set the example of business ethics. And this is an unethical opt-in and opt-out, in my view. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, one more card before lunch. Uh, Richard uh, Lovers, Labors? I don't like pronounce your name, I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Uh, Richard Labors. Labors. Uh, Labors. Deputy Commissioner Deputy at the uh, New Hampshire Department of Employment. Good. And sorry it's taking us so long to get to you, but uh, not a problem. We have a lot of people who want to share. Um, so just getting started, I'm the one responsible for leaving you with a lot of pieces of paper with small numbers on them. So um, just my life will contact me. We'll try to quickly go through those and hopefully answer your questions. Um, just to respond to a, a few of the points that were made that touch upon solvency and the first point as it involves the cost to implement this program. So the Department of Employment Security has been the, the department here in the Hampshire State Government that has been selected to develop and administer this program. We do not currently have a equivalent program to this. We implement the Unemployment Insurance Program, which from the perspective of adjudicating claims, determining whether someone is eligible and receiving in payments from employers, though they are similar. But we do not currently do this type of adjudication. So in order to do that, I had gone and spoken with each of my section heads across the department who would be impacted by this program and said, if you had to adjudicate this many claims, if you had to take in this much revenue, what do you think you would need for staffing? They came back to me with numbers, and I chopped those numbers down. So for someone to say that the estimate for administrative costs when our administrative costs are less than other states that are implementing this program is not accurate. A couple of points there. Number one, look at the fiscal note and the type of state employee that we would have <coughs> adjudicating FMLI claims and compare that to the type of state employee that we, would have, that we currently have adjudicating unemployment claims. Unemployment claims are adjudicated by a higher labor rate because they're more complicated. So the proposal for the staff that would adjudicate FMLI claims are a lower labor grade because I, I think it's a simpler application and an, uh, a simpler process to get the yes or no. If you were to look at the cost per claim to adjudicate the estimated number of family medical leave insurance claims, it's about $17 per initial claim. If you were to look at our 2016 numbers for the cost to adjudicate initial claims for unemployment purposes, it's about $260 per claim. $17 compared to $260. So to suggest that the staffing is inflated, I think is inaccurate. And we can get into the details of the fiscal note. Um, if anything, I'm concerned that the staffing including in the fiscal note is inadequate because now we've included an opt-out. Because we've included an opt-out, so that we've made, there's more options on what needs to be adjudicated. So that does complicate things from an adjudication perspective. But we still under what other states have um, experienced in terms of administrative costs. The solvency analysis, 
the work that the department has tried to do, and in large part it's been done by uh, Bruce DeMay, who's here. He's our director of our Labor Market Information Bureau. Annetta Nielsen is also here. Annetta is an economist with our Labor Market Information Bureau. Um, what we have done since the bill has been amended to include an opt-out um, is not an actuarial analysis. When I try to throw around that term as a lawyer and not an economist, I get kicked. Okay? What we have done is to try to do a mathematical analysis based upon a lot of assumptions that have been made because we don't have any experience to draw from for a similar program either in New Hampshire or a similar program in another state because the other states that have implemented paid family leave have not done it with an opt-out provision. So we had originally provided some uh, material, one page analysis to the House Labor Committee, um, specifically to the subcommittee when they were working on the bill prior to the bill being amended. And what we had done was we had taken 100% of the private sector workforce uh, because based on our reading of the bill, we thought it was safe to assume 100% participation um, <coughs> based upon the fact that we did not feel or had not been presented evidence to show that there was a large segment of the private sector workforce who were provided plans that offered this breadth of uh, leave taking. So we assumed 100% participation and what we found was that taking the assumptions that had been utilized um, in the study that had been done by Dr. Smith in the Carsey School, um, Dr. Smith had relied upon some work that was done by Dr. Hayes with the Institute on Women's Policy Research at the U.S. Department of Labor. So what those assumptions were, were that a 6.4% utilization rate, so take up rate, 6.4% of people will take advantage of the program average duration of about eight weeks with a 12-week maximum. And what we found was the annual revenue and 100% participation was about 156 million and that the annual benefits to be paid out together with administrative costs were about 150 million. So the program before being amended was about six million dollars in a good direction. After House Labor amended the bill and passed the bill as amended, we then had some head scratching because we knew that our prior work at 100% participation was no longer valid. It's no longer valid because with an opt-out, I have to assume that at least somebody is not going to elect to participate in the program. So what we did, and when we get into the information that was distributed out to the committee members, we have uh, three documents, and I can walk you through these three pretty quickly, uh, answer any questions, and obviously I'm available for follow-up questions uh, after you have a further chance to digest the information. So the first document I wanted to talk with you about is this one page here right here. And what this does, <laughs> this is one of the ones you can read. Yeah. Um, what we try to do is take into consideration the opt-out, and how do we do that? We break apart the New Hampshire workforce into 5% total based on earnings. And so we take our, our labor force that would qualify for this program based on earnings, we break them out into 5% cohorts, we look at them at 100%, and then we look at it in 10% increments, down to 90, down to 80, down to 70. And, and here on this chart, you actually go down to 50, and that's 50% participation. And the way we go about dropping that is what we think is a thoughtful, careful way of doing it, is that we take 5% from the top wage earners and 5% from the bottom wage earners at each 10% drop. One assumption that we made that runs consistent throughout these, model, these models is that we think that people will make the decision based upon what is in their own, cell, their own financial best interest in terms of electing to participate. So this page just shows you how our revenue model was calculated. So it's a smarter model than we had previously done 
because now we're, lo we're breaking apart the workforce into 5% cohorts, and we're trying to see what the program looks like at various levels of participation. The second document that you have, which so, like, is before you run away. So, tell me what I'm supposed to be looking at. What is the what is the upshot of this report? Is is the fifty? I guess on the call five dollars or whatever it is. Will this is this sustainable? Is that no. It's not sustainable. No. Um, so the, the Reader's Digest of you, you know. You, took away my thunder, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> which you're allowed to do, so that's okay. Um, I have been known to do that, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, the work that Employment Security has done in a mathematical analysis of various levels of participation is that at an eight-week average duration, at a half percent premium contribution, the only way this program is solvent is at 100 percent participation. At 90% participation, it's no longer solvent. And 80%, it's less solvent, 70%, 60%, so forth. So, uh, but real quick, this other, this is our benefit model. It, goes, it shows you how we calculated the amount of benefits that would be paid out. And again, we broke it out according to 5% cohort. So this benefit modeling is smarter than what we had previously done because here we're looking at what the average benefit would be for each cohort rather than a bigger pool. So it should be more precise. So we took that modeling and then we put together, I think are some easier to digest charts. And there are three scenarios and we can look at your so first one. So let's look at the, the cover. Here. Yeah. So, if so we, is that telling me that if we, went, if we left it at 0.5, we need to go to eight weeks? Is that what, well, that's what this is telling you, so for the first series of uh, models, it is assuming a half percent contribution rate, which is what's in the bill. Okay. And it's assuming an eight week average duration, which was the assumption that was made in the Carsey School study based upon research that had been done by Dr. I Hayes. The bill said 12 weeks, right? there's, a, there's a good point of clarification, so there's a 12 week maximum. They had assumed based on the, what people, the length of leave that they took for the various types of leave that overall would be an eight week duration. Um, to draw a segue to unemployment insurance, people can collect for 26 weeks. Right now New Hampshire averages about 12.8 weeks for average duration. So people don't collect for the full extent to which they're um, allowed to in unemployment, and that was a similar assumption that people made with a 12-week maximum. So when you look at the following pages at the half percent premium and the eight-week duration, you'll see in the first chart, you follow the green line in the, in the chart, and you see that the green line has a slow upward trend, which is good. But it's, again, at 100% participation. We know that 100% participation is not realistic. So we then turn the page and you look at 90% participation and what you see is the green line going down. So that means that we're paying out more in benefits per quarter than we're taking in in revenue. So the program would not be long-term sustainable. If we turn in the bottom right-hand corner of these pages, folks, there's the page number, so I'll just refer to that to kind of get you through these quickly. If we turn to page 10, um, it's our next scenario. And what we did here was we changed some assumptions. And we took a premium and increased it from 0.5 to 0.67, which, again, from the work that uh, Dr. Smith had done and relying upon Dr. Hayes' research, they had uh, suggested that at a 70% participation, you needed about a 0.67 uh, contribution rate. We left the, the average duration at eight weeks in this model, and you'll see in the following pages after that, at 100% participation, solvent. But we know we're not at 100%, and so we go down to, we go work our way to 90, 80, 70, and at 70% participation, which is consistent with the 2016 Granite State poll on people were asked, if you had to pay $5 a week, would you participate? 69% said yes. 70% participation at 0.67 at eight weeks, the program is very, very close. 
and too tight, in my opinion. When you look at one more model, Mr. Chairman, and that's the last model that we have, at page 20, you'll see that we left the premium rate at 0.67, and we decreased the number of weeks to six, rather than eight, and that improves the solvency forecast for the program. The last page, or nearly the last page, what page number? At page 27, you look at 70% participation at a 0.67% premium and an average duration of six weeks. And the program, at least on paper, looks operationally solid. Um, but on paper, I fill out an NCAA bracket every year and every year blows up. <laughs> so this is not drawing upon experience because we don't have any similar experience with a state that has an opt-out. So this is as intelligently as we can do it, as fairly as we can do it, and as thoughtful as we can do it. Look at the work that has been done that we were involved in, and try to take into consideration some of the options that have been put into place, and look at long-term success of this program, which is what our ultimate objective is. Great. Thank you. This is, uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I understand your peak uh, over the administra uh, over the uh, finance uh, proposed uh, with the bill, but we don't have any impact on that. So um, uh, your <coughs> concern about that is not something that we are going to impact. Uh, work that we do. On page 17 um, of the larger uh, presentation, you say that uh, at 75% participation uh, with eight weeks, um, you don't see it as viable. Can you, uh, since the trust fund uh, slowly increases, um, and the trust fund is <coughs> what you would pull benefits from, correctly? Correct. Um, so then, uh, since that continues to slowly rise, why is this not viable? It's a good question, Representative, and what I would direct folks to look at with, you look at page 17, and spend your time looking at the far right hand uh, column there, labeled as Y2Q4, which is year two Q4 of implementation. <coughs> so program's fully up and running. And you'll see in that first row, the total premiums that would come in for that quarter are just under $26.5 million based on the 0.67% premium contribution. If you look at your two bottom rows, you're getting at the quarterly cost of the program. So the $23.9 million represents both your estimated benefits that, go, that would go out that quarter based on, a, uh, um, in this scenario, it's eight weeks average duration, and you build in the estimated maintenance and administrative costs in year 23.9, so $24 million. The bottom row shows you the estimated debt service on a capital appropriation if the legislature were to determine there to make one in order to fund the upfront costs for developing the program, the IT infrastructure for the program, and also for an initial cushion in this fund so that you have something to rely upon if the program doesn't behave the way you forecast it. And at that, you're looking in the bond premium payments, the debt service would be paid um, twice a year, so you can cut that 2.1 million in half, call it a million, <coughs> add it to your 24 million, your costs for that quarter are 25 million, your premium payments for that quarter are 26 and a half, so you're taking in about a million and a half more in revenue for that quarter than you're paying out. There's some points of caution here. One is, what happens when your assumptions are off? These are assumptions. <coughs> if your assumption for average duration is off by one week, the program blows up, okay? If the other wild card that is out there is what people haven't taken into consideration is the churning in the workforce. So if you have an opt out, 
about 15% of our workforce has the op opportunity every quarter to choose whether to participate in this program because they're switching jobs, starting a new job. So that's a 15% churn of someone being presented with the opportunity to participate or not. So it's hard to take into consideration those types of um, uncontrollable aspects of this program without any real experience. Um, so that's why, in my opinion, that 70% at a 0.67 eight-week average duration would not be advisable. What I would advise is um, a six-week duration and if you're going to look at a six-week duration, I wouldn't have a maximum duration above it, at least for your initial implementation of the program. Because again, if your assumption is off by just one week, the modeling shows that the program, in terms of solvency, blows up. It is no longer solvent. Uh, any questions? Thank you. So on page 17 with this average of eight weeks, that was um, a maximum duration of potentially 12 weeks of leave. And are you saying then that there should be no maximum uh, other than um, what, the, uh, what your studies show and that the maximum should be six weeks and no more so that you are guaranteed solvency? I think, Representative, I think at least initially, without any experience in New Hampshire and no experience in another state to look at with an opt-out, I think that at least initially, for say the first two years of the program, that your number of weeks that you're assuming is your average duration should be your max. Because the, the program becomes insolvent and the program breaks down if your assumptions are off. If the department does a great job marketing the benefits available to this program, and we have a you know we have a higher utilization rate, then um, and, a, and the, our assumption for weeks is off, then we're looking at a program that's not going to work. So one concept that um, I would have you think about is for um, determining solvency is you know let's you know you need to spend I think probably two years looking at the program once, once it's up and running. And then, based upon those two years, uh, have a commission that would recommend some uh, wiggle room in terms of the available weeks. There are, there are some parallels that you can draw from how the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund is controlled. And it's not controlled by the department. The legislature has chosen to control solvency for the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund by statute. So the way we currently control solvency in the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund is that when the fund gets too low, there are two surcharges that increase employer tax rates. One has some factors to it, one of which is discretion on the part of the commissioner, but the other one is set at a balance threshold in the fund of $150 million. So the legislature wanted that at a certain point in the fund to increase revenue. On the high end of it, there are, there are statutory set points for balance thresholds in the fund, 250 million, 275, and 300 million, <coughs> at which point employers get discounts on their rate. So we slow the growth of revenue going into the fund. <coughs> so a, a comparable approach on this program could be that based upon experience of the program, in those first two years, you could see where that bottom comfort level is and at a certain point when the fund reaches that certain uh, low threshold, you reduce your weeks. And you have a certain a comfort level on the high end when the fund grows to a certain point, you can grow those weeks. <coughs> um, so that's one way of looking at it, but it's difficult to say what that low point and high point are in a program that has not been tested and we have no experience to draw from. One quick follow-up question. Thank you. The difficulty I have with what you are saying is that if you create a six week maximum, um, you're still going to have an average. You're talking about unemployment, uh, your unemployment use experience as being significantly different uh, on average than the potential maximum. And I understand the desire to be conservative to create a program that is successful, but 
isn't six weeks a maximum not uh, allowing for uh, averaging that is likely to support your modeling? No, that, that's, a, that's a fair question and a, and a good one to kind of throw some of my own statistics back at me with the, with the UI averages. Um, with unemployment, the average right now is 12.8 is weeks duration. That's in a good economy. Um, you see that average duration go up once you get into a recession. Um, my point of caution here with assuming an average duration uh, and making that your, that's your assumption going forward for your um, solvency of your program is that the work that has been done by the Carsey School and, and Dr. Hayes had looked at the three different types of leave that people could take under a program like this and they looked at what their average duration was going to be um, that they would need. I assume that is what they would need because that's what they would take and it was eight weeks. So if you have and uh, uh, I, I think it's difficult to assume an average duration of anything less than that, unless that's your maximum number of weeks that you allow. And that's coming from the agency that has been designated to implement the program. I want something that's long-term, sustainable, and successful, because my people, my, my department, are going to be spending a lot of time and effort and resources on creating this program. And we want to do something that's going to be around for a long time. Thank you. I don't think we're able to move. Yes, thank you for your testimony. Um, did you try to calculate uh, if the um, if the maximum were not reduced, uh, if it stayed the same, how much the 0.67 would have to go up to reach uh, your your level that it would be sustainable? Was that have you have you tried to calculate that? In other words, if we didn't reduce that reduce that, I'm just curious how much more that would that would raise the premium. Uh, I'm not I, I might not be understanding the question correctly, but what, what, yeah. yeah. But I think at so at, at page seventeen that Representative Butler has had us looking at. So that's assuming a seventy percent participation rate, which yes. could change. Yes. That could change, right? Um, and that's your premium at point six seven. If an average duration of eight weeks, some will have more, some will have less, but your average is eight, that's how the program would behave on paper. And in my opinion, one and a half million dollar cushion per quarter is not enough for a, a, a solvent program. May I just throw the question? Yeah, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess my question was if we did not change the, the program at all except to try to adjust the premium, um, how much would it have to be uh, raised in order to make it a sustainable program? Um, we haven't done any modeling that has a higher premium than the point six up here. Thank you. The 100% participation in the numbers that you have, to, that's, we heard your initial was 100% <coughs> So you took out the, the government employees out of your numbers? Huh? The initial numbers that we ran were 100% of private sector. Work. Oh, so the whole time it was just private sector, Correct. never included the... Uh, we never included government because the way the, stat, the way the bill is set up is it'd be subject to be collectively bargained by each group. So for, at least for initial program launch, we're going to assume, let's just look at uh, private sector. Representative Sandler. Thank you. Um, for the record, I am an employer. Um, so I have a couple of technical questions about employment size and so forth that you've heard me ask me these before. So who does this apply to? Is it to all employers, including self-employed? Or where is that threshold? This would be all private sector employers, unless they're able to demonstrate to the department that they have a substantially equivalent plan that they self-insure and provide to their employees. Anyone who employs anyone <coughs> covered by this? Yes. May I ask but can I just make sure I get this thing? If I'm self-employed and I have no employees, I'm not filing with the department now. Correct. Well, the, the way they, some of the piggybacking that the bill does is it defines employment, borrows it from the unemployment statute, Correct. so then you wouldn't be subject. So as long as I'm not filing, if I'm, as long as I'm, if I'm an individual 
and I'm not buying employment security now, quarterly, then I would be exempt from this. Location. Right, so it, it looks at wages and employment, and employment is yeah. defined. That's what I assume, but I wanted to make sure I understood Could, that could I ask a follow-up question? Yes, what absolutely. Are, one of the things you mentioned is you think the complexity of claims would be less than under unemployment compensation. But I'm going to understand that, because this is going to have to do with individuals' medical situation, right, or their family's medical situation. So there's a whole lot of confidential stuff going on, <laughs> right? Because yeah. if I'm asking for a family <laughs> medical leave because my grandmother has an opioid addiction problem, you're asking for a lot of information that's confidential, that could change, that would have to be medically certified. That seems more complicated to me. It, it is more complicated from that perspective, but when it gets to us, it will be less complicated because with a claim for family medical leave insurance, you're right, you're dealing with potentially complex medical situations. When that application comes to us, and this would have to be further clarified in rule, but the way that the bill is set up is that it come, the application comes with a uh, signed statement from the medical professional documenting whatever the, the qualifying condition is. So the adjudicator looking at that application simply looks at, okay, do they have have they been contributing to the program for six months? Do they have the minimum number of, uh, of uh, earnings that is required? And is the reason they're requesting the leave allowable as attested to by a medical professional? So as long as you have the documents, your job is done. Correct. Okay, thank you. So, so if you have a baby, <coughs> the documentation, if I just show the birth certificate, Correct. that will get, get me uh, so before I let you leave, <laughs> um, I, I, I have a different perception of a way to make this bill work, and I briefly mentioned it to you on the phone. So I just want to follow up, because I don't really, I have to admit, I don't know everything about how employment security works. It's always a marvel to me that, that I guess I'm fully vested, that I have all, I have all my employees, and I have never had an employee file. So at this point, I'm, you know, I'm actually paying in the last quarter, it's just 0.1%, which is just this administrative fee. So is this, that administrative fee is just for employment security. Would this program need an administrative fee also? Uh, the way that this has been structured and that is that um, we have estimated the amount of staff and the associated cost to implement the program. The way the bill is structured is that that cost can then be taken out of the trust fund that is created. So that could be capped, that could be further controlled as determined by the legislature. Great. Now, yes. Um, there will be a subcommittee. Yes. Um, and could we ask that you attend the subcommittee meetings, please? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so my last, in my terms of work, maybe he's, he's ready for lunch, but um, is that, when it, it when it comes to unemployment, in terms of the unemployment benefits for an employee, in terms of how much they get, is that written in statute? Okay, so so the, so the point the um, well we would have like the the, uh, the eight weeks, like we would have written that would be written in statute. The way the the way that the FMLI benefit is in the bill is that it sets it up as generally you're looking at a weekly benefit of 60% uh, of your average weekly wage during your best quarter in the last five, okay? The way that uh, it also sets a floor and a ceiling on that is there's a minimum benefit of $125 and a maximum benefit of 85% of the average weekly wage across the state. So right now that maximum would be about 887 per week. Parallel to UI, UI, you have a benefit table that is determined by what your wages were during your base period, so essentially your annual wages. Um, within, ra within ranges, it gets you a certain amount of uh, a benefit per week up to 26 weeks. The maximum that is allowed in unemployment is $427 a week currently. So I guess my, my final question is, let's say we just think that there is enough employers out there who really would like to take advantage of this, okay? And, but they understand that um, they're, they, to join into this, 
if could we write this bill, and just you know, I am and maybe this is a, a pie in the sky, but could we write this this bill is that we are setting up a almost like an insurance entity, insurance company, so that the uh, premium and the benefits could be variable based upon what the department sees actuarially would, that would work and be looking at the trust fund. So just like I see now, when I get my unemployment, I have no idea what my unemployment rate is until literally three weeks before I have to send you a check because you have to have all these other, other things that are going on. Okay, based upon how much claims I'm ha making and whether we're into the you know, surcharge and stuff like that. Is there a way, could we set it up so that, that employers would sign up and join into this program, knowing full well that the rates, things could vary, but that you, and what the benefits would vary. Is there any model like that that could possibly be created for the department? So you would leave it at department discretion for setting the rates based upon the performance of the fund? Right, and, but, it, but my assumption would be is that the, the, it's voluntary for the employer to join the plan. And when they join, they're bringing all their employees with them. Because I am assuming that it's going to be just like it is now for unemployment, which is all employers pay 100%. And I don't know any employer that, that asks their employee to pay unemployment. But so, 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 and then, and then I also had the wild card was that individuals could also then be able to go online and, and, and join the plan also. Um, is, is that a model that could work? That we my three points I would make in, in that model. So the initial election of participation being at the employer level. Correct. Um, trying to forecast that. What we have done after the conversation that we had, Mr. Chairman, was we looked at the most recent time that our labor market information group had actually done a sampling of um, benefits provided by private sector employers in New Hampshire. That was back done in, uh, last done in 2011. <coughs> So we looked at that sampling to see, okay, which employers at what size are providing what types of benefits. And you found that your, your larger employers, 250 plus emplo uh, employees, were more likely, uh, they were about 90%, so 9 out of 10 of them were providing a temporary disability insurance um, offering, a benefit. At least some variation of it. Right. That uh, participation rate um, went way down when you went to your smaller employers. New Hampshire workforce is almost evenly broken um, up, up into 52% of our workforce works for employers of 100 employees or more, um, and 48% works for um, employee, employers with 100 or less, or vice versa. It's about 50-50. Um, so the taking that study done in 2011, if you broke the, those results at employer level, down, so bigger employers more likely to offer it, smaller employers less likely to offer it, you get about a 30% 30, 30 participa participation rate amongst all employers, 30%. which equates to about a 65% participation rate for employees. Um, if the uh, model is off uh, by 5% in terms of participation, that impacts your solvency. If it's off by 10%, it impacts your solvency. So we can look at that. It's a little bit more, um, it's, we're making more assumptions because we're relying upon a survey done in 2011. Um, and again, it's, it's difficult to gauge what the actual behavior would be. Uh, but ultimately, you're looking at the same issues. Your premium contribution and your number of weeks <coughs> and your participation rate are controlling your solvency of your program. So we can run those models and we could do more work with that during, um, if the committee were to uh, create a subcommittee on that. Um, regarding you, this- But you're saying at the end of the day we're gonna have to statutorily set some numbers, we couldn't just leave the department. At the, end, at, at the end of the day, I think that the solvency controls for unemployment insurance have worked well. Those are set in statute. The fund is behaving the way it's supposed to based upon where those controls are. Currently, we have a trust fund for unemployment that's considered solvent by the United States Department of Labor. Um, but we ran out of money during the Great Recession. And we had to borrow to the tune of $120 million from the U.S. Treasury in order to continue to pay benefits in the state. So because Unemployment is a national program, and states, each state has an unemployment program. You have a backstop to rely upon 
and the federal government to continue to be able to pay benefits with cost if you don't pay back things quickly enough. <coughs> but you have the ability to draw upon the U.S. Treasury to continue to pay benefits. New Hampshire had to do that. We paid it all back without any cost because we paid it back quickly because of reforms made and employers stepping up and employer pay, employers paying more in their unemployment taxes. But what I'm saying is that it's hard that setting those controls and statute works well right now. I wouldn't advise at putting those controls just in the hands of the department because the department doesn't have a program to look at either right now in terms of behavior for, for this type of benefit. So I think looking at actual behavior over a, a two-year period um, and then setting some of those controls, but setting them in statute, I think would function better. Um, and then you have a, a better understanding of what your maximum weekly benefits can be and how to control those, how to shrink them, and how to grow them based upon the performance of the fund and the utilization of the program. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to go into recess uh, for lunch. So we'll be back at uh, 2, 205. How are we going to do that? Adventures in the Free State Death Great. I just okay. on my shoulder. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Not Do not film me playing solitaire. We'll, uh, no, I we open the public hearing on House Bill 628. That would be a breach of trust. And, uh, and I'm going to go through these cards and we'll see what happens. Is uh, Steve Chapman still around? The Inter Pediatric Society? Yes. Going once, going twice. I am still here. Excellent. There you go. I promise to be as brief as I can be. Great. <laughs> You understand the task is to do the church. I will do my very best. Um, but um, thank you for your time. My name is Steve Chapman. I am uh, president of the New Hampshire Pediatric Society. Um, I grew up in New Hampshire, raised my kids in New Hampshire. I've been a small business owner. I understand that side of things. Um, I chair a committee, now a search committee, to bring physicians into the state of New Hampshire. And I tell you what I hear on a regular basis is how are the schools, how are, is how kid friendly is New Hampshire, is this a good place to raise a family? And I tell them each and every time that New Hampshire is the best state in the nation in which to raise kids. So I am asking to this committee to work out um, the details to not make me a liar, <laughs> um, that this is a great place to, um, to raise kids in New Hampshire. So I see kids every day. I see them coming home with newborns. I take care of them through high school. I see kids from the early 20s. Um, having a child or caring for a sick one is most, one of the most important and meaningful experiences in human existence. But far too often, I see many parents forced to choose between their livelihood on one hand and, the, and income on one hand and their child's best interests on the other. Parents with newborns going back to work too early because otherwise they can't afford the rent or keep the car. And parents sometimes who can't be with their children when they're in the hospital because missing a paycheck is not an option. About a month ago I saw a single mom who had to return to work before her child had regained birth weight and was still in the hospital because she couldn't afford not to work. Um, I see every day and there are kids back in the hospital, back up in Lebanon, um, up at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, where parents are deciding whether to go back to their job and leave their kid at home or at, in the hospital by themselves without the parent there so that they can keep their job, or whether they stay in the hospital and, and care for their kids. It's, a, it's not a choice that we want parents to make. We know that parents' time with newborns is critical. There's no one else better to take care of kids than their parents. And we also know there's just emerging, emerging evidence, epigenetics and neurodevelopmental evidence, that the first few months and the first few years of a child's life are critically important to brain development. Children who are given a strong foundation for their brain architecture development in the, be in the beginning are proven to be more productive contributors to society. This saves, this saves the state money in the short run, and the long and the long run in ed special education, juvenile justice, health care, and unemployment. Kids need their parents when they're seriously ill. Have a, having a parent by their side makes a significant difference to their recovery. At the same time, 
Paid leave reduces parents' stress levels in those difficult circumstances. Yet lacking paid leave, some parents make the heart-wrenching decision to, to leave their sick children alone in the hospital in order to preserve their family's economic security. This is one of those rare win-win-win-win scenarios. It's good for kids, it's good for parents, it's great for the workforce and employers, and it's absolutely essential for a cutting edge New Hampshire economy in the 21st century. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Chair, we'll call on Jessica Sugru. She had to leave. I have some written testimony that she left. Yeah. I'll, I'll pass that in. Okay. Thank you. Switch it up. Uh, Greg Moore. Greg, there he is. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. For the record, my name is. It was Greg. morning. Uh, it was. It was just, this hearing was supposed to happen in the morning. So. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's still morning because because the next hearing started in the afternoon. It couldn't be afternoon because that means they're pushing them back. Um, I, I welcome the opportunity to speak before this committee today. Uh, for the record, my name is Greg Moore. I am the New Hampshire State Director for Americans for Prosperity. Here today to speak, speak in opposition to House Bill 628. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about an issue near and dear to the chair and I we've been talking about it for a good 15 years now. That's the issue of crowd out in the private insur insurance marketplace. Um, given the fact that I'm currently scheduled to be in three places at once right now, I'm going to keep this mercifully you short. Know it. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, you, you and me both, right? <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on the health care, how the in interjection of, of uh, government programming has interfered with the marketplace. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to bring you to one line in the fiscal note from the insurance department. The insurance department says if this bill becomes law, the aforementioned commercial insurance would become obsolete. In other words, the Department of Insurance has made it abundantly clear that we would destroy the short-term disability marketplace with the passage of this legislation. And I heard before that the, that the uh, short-term disability marketplace does not cover all the things that this covers. Uh, I actually spent a little bit of time doing a little online research, went to Mass Mutual, clicked on employers. It's amazing how customizable you can make these programs. You can make them go for three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. Whatever you want as far as, uh, uh, as, far as a payout, you can adjust that and make your payments accordingly. Right now, employers have a very robust, vibrant option, and this legislation would destroy it. Um, ultimately, that would come at the cost for some people of a better policy than they would get from this, uh, from this particular piece of legislation. Moreover, allowing people to customize their policies <coughs> gives them the opportunity to use it as a better recruitment or retention tool than a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, another another uh, huge issue I, I could see as far as actual getting uh, that would cause people to opt out, if you look on page two, uh, lines 22 and 23, I note that it's uh, one half percent of wages per employee per week for the, for the uh, uh, preceding quarter. In other words, it is an uncapped payroll tax. Uncapped payroll tax. Yet the benefit, if you look on page three, lines 35, is 85% of the average weekly wage in New Hampshire. Uh, using the New Hampshire Employment Securities numbers, that is a little bit under $54,000. And what that means is at about $75,000, you would stop getting any additional benefit. So if you're above $75,000 roughly, in other words, the people that we've heard we need to attract, you would continue to pay in but gain no additional benefit from those payments. So, so uh, ultimately, uh, you would probably see more and more of those people choose to opt out given the fact that, that their benefit is capped but their payment is not. Uh, additionally, we've also heard that uh, the unsustainability arguments, I don't need to to uh, retread that ground. And, and ar already a recommendation from the sponsors about uh, a 34% increase in the payroll tax to go along with this in order to try to make it more sustainable. I suspect that would not be the end of it. Finally, uh, we share the same concerns uh, of, of the opt-in versus opt-out, the manner in which that is implemented. Uh, ultimately, if we're continuing to change the terms and conditions of of the program, we should give people the opportunity to exit the program when those terms and conditions change. Uh, so with that, I will conclude my testimony and, and take any questions from the committee. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chair will call on Amanda Sears, campaign for family economy. Sorry, 
sardines back there, sorry. Um, Good afternoon, thank you. And thank you for um, your time today on this important issue. Um, the Campaign for a Family-Friendly Economy represents about 25,000 supporters across the state, um, and we have been working on policies that um, can help families to make ends meet and to be there for their families when they need to be. Um, caregiving responsibilities are one of the biggest things keeping people out of our workforce, um, and with a state that needs to be um, accessing <coughs> our workforce as much as possible, that's a, a big problem for our economy. Um, we, uh, the need for sensitive, sensible family leave policies has increased as our workforce um, participation increases, where you have fewer families that have a caregiver full-time at home, uh, with more people in the workforce. It means that when a caregiving <coughs> need comes up, um, somebody needs to be able to take the time out to provide that caregiving need. Um, currently, about two-thirds of our workforce lacks access to family le to leave that covers these three types of leave. Care for oneself, care for a family member, um, and care for a new child. So when you have heard about the access to short-term disability insurance, both from our, our previous speaker and, and others this morning, that short-term disability insurance that um, was talked about, that I think um, the numbers were something like 30% of our, our, I'm not sure, I think it was 30% of our, our um, population has, um, that only covers care of oneself. So it doesn't cover care of a newborn. Um, it covers the recovery time for a mother um, following the birth, but doesn't cover paternity care or care of a newborn. It also doesn't cover care of a family member. And so if you have somebody who needs to be um, at home, you know, in the, um, we heard a lot from folks in the, um, in the industry around nursing homes. And so when an aging uh, parent that many of us are taking care of um, is injured, um, they often, um, if they don't have somebody available to take care of them, those people end up in rehabilitation facilities at a much higher cost than if they were able to go home and somebody were able to help them with some basic functioning of life. So there's an economic aspect there as well. Um, uh, businesses, I wanted to talk about what business experience in other states has been um, with this kind of a program. Um, there are programs, um, long, most long-standing one is in California. Um, there's also programs uh, in, in Rhode Island. Um, in New Jersey, New York just started a program on January 1st. Um, California has <coughs> had the longest place, the longest program in place. Their experience um, from businesses has been 90% of businesses reporting <coughs> that family and medical leave insurance um, programs have helped reduce employee turnover, increase worker productivity, and either helped or didn't hurt their bottom line. With 87% of businesses in California reporting no increased costs associated with the program, and 9% re reporting cost savings. And the Society for Human Resource Managers, uh, four, five years after the California program went into place, um, reported that the program was less onerous than expected and noted that employer concerns um, that were there before the program had started had not been realized. Um, this, uh, as you've heard, this program was, would uh, be funded by employee payroll deductions um, and would pro provide partial temporary wage replacement for people. Um, the, uh, we know that most employers try to do the right thing um, by their workforce, um, and uh, but really, you know, right now it's resulting. What's happening is that people um, have to win the boss lottery. So, you know, if they have access to this kind of benefit if they happen to have a great boss who has who offers it. But if not, they often can't access it because short-term disability insurance is something that is typically accessed um, through the employer, and so individuals tend to not even have much access to that kind of a program um, because. Uh, uh, so there is some access, but there's not nearly um, the kind of access there is through employers. Um, so uh, when a working person unexpectedly loses their job, we have unemployment insurance that helps to provide them with temporary partial wage replacement so they can stay on their feet financially. Um, this is um, built to mirror that. Similarly, when an, <coughs> when an employed person gets hurt on the job, we have workers' comp insurance to help provide that kind of financial security. But if a working person gets hurt or needs to take time out, off of um, the job site, we don't have that kind of financial security, and this, this bill is seeking to build that. Um, you know, my uh, campaign has been working closely with the sponsors on this legislation um, from the beginning, um, and we, I just would like to say that we would be very happy to work with um, the subcommittee that is uh, put together to um, discuss some of the ideas that the sponsors and others have shared about mechanisms um, for 
uh, the way that this program functions. Um, so I'd be happy to work with, on an amendment um, with the sponsor, with the committee on that sponsor. Thanks so much. Thank you. And I have um, testimony from a few other folks who had to leave that I'm going to pass in as well. Um, testimony from um, Kimberly Kirkland, owner of Reese and Kirkland in Manchester, New Hampshire, um, as well as uh, testimony from the Chamber Collaborative of Greater Portsmouth, the Portsmouth Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to pass those in too. Chair will call on Amanda Osborne. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Osmer, and I'm one of the owners of Burponi Automotive. It's a privately held company uh, just over the line in Bow, New Hampshire. We employ 340 team members at this point. Um, I, I recognize the complexity. I appreciate the complexity before you. I don't envy you having to make decisions and changes trying to make everybody happy because we're a business owner. We all know you can't do that. Um, I would say that in the research I've done on this bill, there are obviously some things that need to be worked out and massaged a little bit. But my feeling is at the end of the day, I really feel like it's worth working through. It's worth looking at the details and trying to use your collective creative energy and your powers to come up with a solution, if at all possible. So I am in support of um, House Bill 620. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Chair, we're calling Henry Bayou, representing the American Council of Budget Insurers. Opposition to the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Henry Bayou, and I'm here on behalf of the American Council of Life Insurers. Um, and I checked off oppose. Uh, we don't oppose the whole bill. We, we, we have an issue uh, with a certain aspect of the bill. Um, the American Council of Life Insurers uh, is made up of uh, companies that provide life insurance, retirement benefits, annuities, <coughs> long-term care, and disability income insurance. Um, and if you look at the fiscal analysis, look at the very, very, very last page of the bill and the fiscal analysis. Um, the insurance department, in its fiscal analysis, uh, points out the issue that we have with the bill. It says, the insurance department states the insurance plans currently exist that would provide coverage for the types of benefits included in this legislation. I think they're specifically referring to disability income insurance. Um, the coverage is sold on a voluntary basis to employers who desire to provide these benefits to employees. The department doesn't know uh, how much of this product is currently sold, uh, and if this bill becomes law, the aforementioned commercial insurance would become obsolete. Um, so the issue that we have with the bill, um, where it intersects is on page two of the bill, um, we're talking about family and medical leave means leave from work. Um, at the bottom of page one, it, it has A and B, two kinds of conditions. C, uh, and then D says, because of a serious health condition of the employee that isn't related to employment. And that is the product. That's, that's the market that our members are in right now and provide that. Um, if this was something that was provided through the state program, there'd be no reason for an employer to purchase this uh, on the market uh, because they'd already have it covered here. So it basically would make what we provide um, you know, worthless. Um, so uh, that's the issue that we have with, with uh, the bill here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you have a sense of uh, how much of that product you sell uh, or your uh, members sell in the state? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll ask them. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Bailey. Uh, since uh, this kind of uh, family leave uh, legislation exists in other states, do you have uh, can you cite us evidence that this has uh, decimated the the uh, insurance that your uh, disability insurance coverage that you're you're talking about? Has that happened elsewhere? Or could you find that out for us? 
Thank you. Mr. Bayou, um, you said that you're not opposed to the whole bill. Correct, because we, uh, it doesn't really. So how would, you, how would you say that you are in favor of the bill? Um, <laughs> the only, if, if, if you were to take D out, uh, it wouldn't impact um, the, our, our members at all. So I would have no reason to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Henry. Yeah. So, uh, Lisa Domain. Here. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> um, my name is Lisa Domain. I'm one of those statistical anomalies. I grew up in New Hampshire. I went to University of New Hampshire Durham, and I stayed here. And in 2017, I was the main caretaker for both of my parents, and we were able to get by, but now I have credit card debt, and I owe them three months' rent. In March of 2017, my mom had a work-related injury. It was not considered part of workers' compensation because there was no witness to her injury. She, um, <coughs> the first two weeks, she was unable to hold things and use her arms. Um, she would reserve any energy that she had to do that for independence in the bathroom. Um, so this means this is my third part-time job now, taking care of my mother. Um, while either I was at my two part-time jobs or my dad was at his full-time job, her retired friends were her caretaker. Um, thankfully, she is entirely rehabilitated from them. Um, and thankfully, my parents had enough savings to cover the cost <coughs> for that. Um, but yeah, I needed help for rent the next month before the medical bills even came in. In October 2017, my father was diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, it took two and a half weeks to get the diagnosis. Um, he had a stomach ache for some time. Went to the doctor and they said that they needed a test done at Exeter Hospital. Um, the test came back that he had cancer in his pancreas, but they didn't know if that's where it started. Um, right then, I put in my two weeks at my full-time job that I had earned and gotten up to. Um, put in my two weeks because I knew that with this job, I had only worked there for several months and only was earning two um, paid days off a month. So I put my two weeks in and the day after my last day of work at that job, my dad got his first appointment for a biopsy of his pancreas. Um, genetic tests came back and long story short, we're very thankful that his cancer has decreased, but he will be a lifelong cancer patient. Um, had a bill similar to HB 626 been enacted for 2017, I would not have thousands of dollars of credit card debt. I would not owe my parents and friends hundreds of dollars for rent. And I would have had, I would have been working today because I would not have had to come here for an entire day from Dover to um, take a day off work as a substitute teacher in Dover, which is what I do right now. Um, and that is my testimony, and I just really hope that you see that there's a lot of faces behind this bill, and I'm one of them, and I could have had benefited from this bill had New Hampshire taken paid family medical leave um, by this point. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Chair, we'll call on Kimberly Kirkland. Call business owners for the bill. I pass that testimony again. Oh, that's right. Uh, Jennifer Bertrand? She stepped out for another hearing. She'll return shortly. She will be back. Uh, Michael uh, Levy, the best. Opposition. Good afternoon, my name is Mike, Mikey Levis. I live in Manchester. Thank you for taking time out of your hopefully otherwise productive days to be here. About two and a half years ago, I moved to New Hampshire from New Jersey because New Hampshire is a state without an income tax and without a sales tax. This is a blatant backdoor to an income tax. There are a number of states that already have a family medical leave bill, such as my home state of New Jersey. I suspect Massachusetts and Vermont will soon implement that. Why don't those who support this bill move there where the program already exists? Connecticut has implemented a number of programs and is now a fiscal disaster. Additionally, the federal government, under President Trump, 
is considering such a program. I work in a restaurant, and I previously worked in retail, and I hope to own a business one day. In a few months, I'll be undergoing a minor surgery, and I hope to have a family someday. <coughs> I don't have issues, I plan for them, I save up like a responsible adult. About a year and a half ago, I, by saving up over many years, I was able to take a trip to Europe, and over the years, I've able, been able to take off, take off for just time off for various purposes. Having worked in various fields, I've seen the immense burden such a bill would cause on the employees and the employers, both in applying for it or administering it. And they're already swamped with lots of paperwork for various other programs, benefits, taxes, regulations, etc. How can this bill or program cover all the benefits, administration, and other things that it will entail? This is so important. Why haven't unions, why, haven't, why hasn't the Chamber of Congress implemented a private version of this program? If it's so necessary, why don't we have it already? We have car insurance, we have health insurance, we have house insurance, we have other insurances. This is not insurance, this is another welfare scheme. And given that there's no private demand for it, we don't need it. And how long will, the, will it be before this half a percent almost tax becomes an income tax? They lied to us about Social Security, they lied to us about Medicare, they lied to us about other programs, and they're all heading to insolvency. This one will too. Are we being lied to again? I don't think workers look for programs when they move to a state, and they don't look for which one has the most welfare programs. If workers are needed, why don't, why don't businesses or the Chamber of Commerce or whatever advertise for workers? I imagine some people have read the John Steinbeck novels, The Grapes of Wrath, and Of Mice and Men, where people traveled hundreds if not thousands of miles to work in other states. Clearly that's still possible. What would be needed to attract workers is to encourage private development of strong cities and towns, not another welfare scheme. They always tell us that this isn't now going to be an income tax or it's now it's insolvent, but let's think about the future, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road when this becomes unsustainable. What will happen then? The bill as it is now might be one thing, but there will be repairs later on. This will lead to an income tax. It will be a disaster, and I urge you all to oppose it in any way you can and prevent any similar program from ever being implemented. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Chair Paul Philip Spagnola. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members sure. of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today in support of Bill 628. Um, I'll, I'll stay to the numbers as you requested. You do have my written testimony. You can read the background. Uh, my name is Val Zanchuk. I'm president of Graphicast, which is a small manufacturing uh, company in Jaffrey. Uh, for the record, I'm the past board chair of the Business and Industry Association of New Hampshire. However, I'm not here today representing the BIA. Uh, Graphicast has 22 employees, and we currently provide a company paid short and long-term disability for them. Uh, currently, I have one employee out on uh, short-term disability, and in looking at the uh, projected uh, cost for the uh, FMLI, um, the, the incremental cost for me uh, would be anywhere from $1,000 to about $3,000 per year compared to my current premium for short-term disability. Obviously, the coverage would be much greater. It's not just focused on the, uh, the medical needs of the <coughs> employer. And at that rate, uh, I would continue to pay for that, that, that premium for my employees. I feel it's a benefit that uh, is important <coughs> for me to offer them. Um, in the last year, I've had two employees who would have used this. Uh, one took uh, a non-paid leave. Uh, the other committed suicide. So we've, uh, we've been affected by the, the impact of, of the lack of this, this uh, type of insurance. Um, I'm involved in a lot of workforce development activities in the state. I know what our uh, 
our challenges are, and I think a, a paid leave program would be a real workforce driver for the state. And I think it's very important for us to adopt this policy, and I urge the committee to explore the various financial options for the best way to structure it toward a goal of setting up a program that will work for all. Thank you. So, do you mind telling us? I'm sorry? How much your insurance your disability? My short term disability is $5,500 a year. $5, so, $5, right. So, the 0.5% of, of, of payroll would mean that my uh, FMLI would be 6250 per year, and if it went up to the 0.75%, I would be up at around $8,500 a year. Uh, at the highest rate, it comes out to $8 per employee per week on average. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, you would keep your short-term disability no. insurance? No, I would no. dump it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, money talks, so I, I would dump it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chair will call Bruce Berkey, representing the National Federation of Independent Business. In opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Bruce Berkey. I'm the State Director for the National Federation of Independent Business, the NFIB. has over 1,400 small business members here in the state of New Hampshire and uh, we are opposed to <coughs> House Bill 628. Heard this morning um, that conceptually people were not opposed to it, and, and I think you could probably put the NFIB in that category. But we also heard this morning, or before your break, from some of it was in the afternoon, uh, some very sobering uh, numbers. And that's why we're here today, because of those numbers. Uh, as currently drafted for this particular issue, they just don't add up to a stable program. And if there's one thing that the business community wants as much as possible, they never get 100%, but they want certainty. They want certainty to a tax structure, they want certainty to state regulations, they want certainty within their, their own business operations as much as possible. And it is clear from what we have read, from what we have heard, that there's a lot of uncertainty as it relates to House Bill 628 as currently drafted. I won't go into all of the, everything else I was going to say because you've already heard it, and so I'll leave you with that. Let's have as much certainty as we can before 628 passes into law. Thank you, and I'd be happy to try and address any questions. Mr. Bartlett has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Have, um, may I ask you a, a question if, if you've ever known of any new program that had complete certainty to it and that you still hesitated to be part of it? Um, I, 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 I won't get into the specifics of that. It's a, it's a fair question, and, and I, I'll try and get you an answer um, of more spe specificity. Please pardon my speech impediment right now. Um, but I, I think that you're right, there is uncertainty with anything you do. But with this particular bill, we know there's uncertainty based upon the numbers we've seen. And so with that, I think, I, I, I caution the committee in going forward. Thank you. Good question, Ann Carter. Thank you. Um, this is only the public hearing. This is the first step in this committee for this yes. bill. Um, we'll be having subcommittee meetings. Um, is it something that you might be interested in um, attending? Because I think that it's uh, clear to most of us that this bill won't pass out of this committee as written right now. I think that we're 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 in. Is this a question? Uh, asking if you would be willing to. You won't be here, believe you me. <laughs> I, I, I have been participating in this process for many years, and I will be too. Yes, you will be here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to uh, uh, follow up on what Representative Barbara was saying, um, it is easy to say it won't work. Can you bring ideas, suggestions? Uh, helpful process uh, for us so that we can get to yes? 
I, I'd certainly uh, be happy to try and work with the committee or subcommittee on, on something. Um, we are not an organization that just says no. Thank you. I, I guess I can't let you run away without pointing this out, uh, that uh, um, I don't get often to ever venture anything over to the Labor Committee, but one time, one summer, I got appointed to a study committee about unemployment. And there was two industries which are never, ever fully solved. And I believe you represent one of those industries? Would that be the ski industry, Mr. Chairman? That's what, what was the other one? I don't recall. Pavers. The, the, summer, as, the summer asphalt guys. Oh, okay. pavers, yes. That their expertise is such as that they, we never, we can never, pay, they can never pay enough in unemployment to make out for all the benefits that we have to pay. Mr. Chairman, to answer that question, I think. Um, I, what I am here today representing NFID in, in opposition to the bill as presented, but I can tell you that I have many other business clients as well that have a lot of wariness about this particular bill and, and how it's been going forward to date. And, and so, um, you know, if there is an effort to improve upon it, make it better, make it more uh, appropriate, um, we'd be happy to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair, we'll call on Dr. Edwin Dunn. <laughs> good afternoon. I had good morning written on my testimony. Uh, my name is Dr. Ove Young. I've been an obstetrician gynecologist in Concord for 35 years. I'm a past president of the New Hampshire Medical Society and continue to serve on their general council representing obstetricians in our state. Also, uh, I am a clinical professor of OB-GYN at Dartmouth's Geisel uh, School of Medicine, uh, having taught <coughs> students and uh, residents for the 35 years I've been in practice. Thank you, uh, Chairman Hunt and members of this committee uh, for your work and uh, for allowing me to speak in support of House Bill 628. I strongly believe that creating a family and medical leave insurance system would ensure workers the benefits they need and would make New Hampshire businesses of all sizes more competitive. I think you have all read a letter signed by over 100 businesses in New Hampshire, including Concord Hospital, asking you to pass this bill. These employers, like Amanda Osmer at Caponi Toyota and Bob Stegmeyer at Concord Hospital, understand the challenges facing their employee with a critically ill child, a dying parent, or a member of the family who's ravaged by substance abuse. The benefits of this bill, I think, are obvious, uh, given those situations. But today, as an obstetrician, I wanted to uh, address what I feel is an equal, maybe even more far-reaching benefit to New Hampshire families. When paid leave is provided a new mom or new parents after uh, their child is born. Now I'm not very comfortable in rooms like this. I've testified before, but I still am a little uncomfortable. So I'm going to take you to labor and deliver. <laughs> <laughs> Where I have watched consistently young couples look at each other after a long, hard, difficult delivery and say, finally, it's over. <laughs> and I whisper to myself, it's just <laughs> I see those women six weeks later when they're still healing. Some of them are back to work. Some are trying to get back to work, not knowing what to do. 
with their baby and most of them not wanting to leave their new baby. Barry Brazelton, 50 years ago, he's 95 years old, Boston pediatrician, still alive. Barry Brazelton, and Representative Guile knows him well, taught us that bonding in the first few days of life is absolutely critical to the development of that child. What he called attachment is paramount in the future of that baby. I always say very simply, those of us who have been loved well, learn to love well. Those of us who've been deeply cared for, learn to deeply care for others and our world. Now, after several years of practice, it occurred to me that I uh, can provide a wonderful childbirth experience and deliver a healthy baby, but it won't mean a thing if we don't take care of that mom and baby when they leave the hospital. All new parents want to be new parents, but not all of us have had good modeling. Nor do some have the resources to be the parent they want to be. Those of us who have children know that no matter how well educated or well motivated, the challenge of caring for that newborn some days can be overwhelming. I felt so strongly about this issue that I created what's called the Healthy Beginnings Endowment at Concord Hospital. It's a $1.3 million fund now, endowment fund, and annually we provide grants to programs in the Concord community who support parents, support and educate new parents. And it is unquestionably making us a better community. I am convinced that if we want a healthy society, if we want young adults not abusing themselves and not abusing others, if in turn we want good parents in the future generation and a responsible community, we have to create four and five year olds with a deep sense of self-worth. We are the only developed country in the world that does not provide aid and relief. France, England, Germany, Canada give six to 12 months of paid family leave. It's interesting that there's far less crime in Europe than in the United States. And that Europeans live longer than us, even though they smoke and drink more than us. Remarkably, their healthcare costs are half what our costs are in this country. So I have a dream this week, celebrating Martin Luther King. I have a dream that we will realize the wisdom in paid family leave and medical leave. I strongly urge you to pass House Bill 628 to improve the health and the future of our grand state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Marty Road. Here. What?
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Rebecca Hutchinson. I live in Deerfield. I am uh, retired now, but I was the director of a century of uh, in-home care for eight years and the director of a home care, another home care agency for many years before that. Um, in my 20 years as a home care administrator, I saw many, many, many families who were incredibly deeply committed to keeping their loved ones at home and to provide great care for them. Um, but we saw how difficult that was when folks had to work and when their, the, the adult children were working full time with little or no paid time off. We frequently got calls from family members with immediate needs, i.e., I gotta go to work tomorrow, my father fell, we need help. We also got calls from other family members who had been told by um, hospital discharge planners that their adult, uh, you know, that their uh, parent could be released from the hospital, but they couldn't go home and be alone. And these last minute requests are the most difficult for home care agencies to serve. I'm sure you're all aware that there's a workforce shortage, and I hope that you're aware that it's acute in the home care world. Um, home care agencies are regularly turning down home care requests because they simply don't have the staff to fill them. So as an administrator for over 20 years, I saw multiple um, stories and, and experiences where families needed uh, help and could have been helped by this kind of legislation. But I also believe that this would make a big difference to home care workers. And frankly, that's where my passion most is. Um, I recently spoke with a paid pay caregiver from a century in home care, and she provided this brief statement for me to read today. She was unable to come because she wasn't willing to take a day off from her clients. She, uh, I think it was four clients she had a day between eight and six, and she didn't feel that she should not show up. So I'm gonna read her brief statement. My name is Dory Grenier. I live in Rochester with my husband and I provide home care assistance to five different elderly clients in the Rochester area as an employee of Acentria in Home Care. My father and mother also live in Rochester and my father needs lots of care. He's very depressed and will not talk to anyone about it. He is 82 and has end stage renal kidney failure and is on dialysis three days a week. He has been hospitalized many times from having to have uh, stints put in, he is AFib, he was in the hospital for 14 days a few years ago for diverticulitis and had to have a good portion of his intestines removed. My mother, who is 78, is the only other caregiver for my dad as I am an only child. My parents don't have other close friends left and our extended family are all up in Maine. My husband also helps when he can. In the past year, I have missed many days of work when my father ended up in the ER or hospital and when my mother was sick and could not care for him. Sometimes I've missed a day or two or week or consecutive days as well. And this has been going on for years. I cannot afford to miss much work. I make $10.51 an hour and I work between 36 and 42 hours per week depending on how much work my agency can give me in Rochester, which is where I can, as far as I can drive. She lives in Rochester and does not have a car that works great, so she has clients only in Rochester. My agency gives me 39 hours of earned time off each year and 22 hours of floating holidays. So that comes out to about, I think, uh, 7.5 days per year. I do not get any other vacation or sick days and I cannot accrue my earned time. If I do not use it in a year, I lose it. I understand that if this bill passes, I would have to pay about $2.10 per week from my weekly paycheck into the paid leave fund. I would happily do that in order to be able to get some compensation when I have to take time off to care for my father. If this bill is passed, it would mean that I wouldn't have to worry so much about losing pay if I needed to take time off to help my dad. I absolutely love my job and I know how much my clients depend on me to be there every day. But there are days I need to be there for my parents as well. And so I feel so torn so many times. So she states the challenge that many home care workers have throughout our state who day in and day out care for our elderly. I would urge you to vote 
uh, House Bill 628 out to pass. I'm also a former um, legislator myself and served on the Labor Committee, so I have some, some experience with unemployment, and I also understand the challenge that you have before you to make a bill that is, in fact, sustainable. I appreciate the Chair's requests for focusing on that. And I've been here all morning, and I would like to just briefly suggest that you probably are going to have to tweak this bill. We understand that. I would ask you to remember that portability is very important, particularly to the home care world, because many home care workers work several different agencies to try to put together something resembling 40 hours a week. So that portability is very important. I hope you won't lose that. Um, I would also suggest that in, regarding the issue of solvency, I, I appreciated the testimony from the Department of Employment Security this morning. Um, I would recommend, just from my experience in the home care world, that if you've got to do some tweaking, I think the reduction in the number of weeks, you know, six, having six weeks is a whole lot better than having no weeks. So if you've got to muck with some stuff to make it work, that would be my suggestion. Um, and finally, I, I also listened to the gentleman this morning who talked about the sort of legal or ethical questions of opt-in and opt-out. And I, I, I would agree that um, if, if th you probably do need an additional opt-out opportunity if um, the employee cost changes dramatically. And I, I'm assuming, you know, I understand the concept of giving the department a, a range of how much they can the, the, the amount, the 0.5% uh, and giving that a, a range. So I, I would also agree that particularly for low wage workers, um, if that number that they are going to have to uh, put in changes dramatically, I would agree that there ought to be, there, ought, there needs to be notification and opportunity for that. So I hope I've given you some suggestions about where to go. I know you've got a lot of work to do, but you really need to understand and feel with your soul the importance of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Take a little <coughs> question down. Uh, Gail Taylor. Uh, D. Dustin. I have her testimony, and I had to step out to testify at another hearing. Um, I'm Jennifer Bertrand. I've been here since this morning. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. Good for you. Is that all right? Why not? All right. <sighs> all right. So my name is Jennifer Bertrand. I live in Mont Vernon, New Hampshire, and uh, I work in Atkinson, New Hampshire, uh, at Community Crossroads, one of the 10 designated area agencies in the state of New Hampshire. And we are asking you to uh, support HB 628. Um, there might be a few tweaks that might be made to the bill, uh, and I would hope that everybody can roll up their sleeves uh, with the folks that helped to bring it forward to find a workable solution. I wanted to share uh, in particular um, a story relevant to uh, the financial aspects and benefits of passing um, HB 628. I'm going to start off by um, passing out a few pictures of my family because this, you know, while I work full time, my husband works full time as an engineer for MITRE, um, this particular bill has some particular personal significance to us and also for the 1,200 individuals that we serve in the Region 10 areas of the state at Community Crossroads. Um, Community Crossroads helps provide support guidance and advocacy to uh, individuals and their fam individuals with developmental disabilities and other disabilities uh, and their families. Um, so here's my daughter Chloe. She's now 18 years old and she's working at Whole Foods and uh, she's a senior in high school. She experiences a significant developmental and intellectual disability. Uh, but with uh, a determination uh, that we wanted her to be able to experience everything that our other three children have opportunities to experience and a faith in finding a way of what would it take to, for the support she might need. I know that there's a representative here today from Amherst who probably knows the Garvey family, Paula. She has a daughter who experienced cystic fibrosis mm -hmm. and very much uh, supports this bill as do the folks 
in the cystic fibrosis community. Very important to them. <clears throat> so I just wanted to give you some context from where I'm coming from and my experiences. So back uh, in middle school, Chloe was experience, experiencing some orthopedic challenges and she had to have a very involved surgery, which meant that she had at least five weeks in a long leg cast where she couldn't bear weight. Chloe has significant challenges being able to communicate and I was afraid like she wouldn't necessarily not try to bear weight and with her body weight and the weight of her cast, I could not lift her myself and transfer her, bathe her, change her um, without assistance. Now, my husband, Sean, at the time, I wasn't working because I took 10 years off to support and advocate for Chloe so that she could reach her fullest potential so she can graduate high school job and career ready and to be self as self-sufficient as she possibly can, right? That's the goal, um, the educator of me speaking. Um, but while he was covered under the FMLA and you know he would have a job waiting for him, with only one income in the home and four children and planning for a lifetime of uh, helping Chloe to support herself because of the nature of her disability, plus hopefully sending three other children through college so they would be around. I'm not gonna live for the rest of time and who's gonna be here to advocate and help oversee for Chloe to make sure she's treated with dignity and has what she needs. So he couldn't take that time off. We would have been in a very financially insecure position. We might have lost our house. We might have lost our savings. Um, and it was a very <coughs> difficult time. Um, thankfully, I was able to go through the channels and we applied for some Medicaid assistance so that we could have a nurse come in and assist me while my husband was at work for those five weeks. <coughs> if HB 628 was in place at the time, I would have been paying into that program, and if it's passed, I will be paying into that program. It would have been much more beneficial for Chloe's very difficult recovery and for him to support me, given her unique needs. You know, there, you cannot compare the comfort he could have given Chloe and the support for me to get through that very difficult time. Um, you know, it was nice to have the nurse, but it would have been so much easier on her family. Um, so let me just give you a couple of numbers before I wrap up quickly here, because I know it's been a long day. I've been here since before the hearing started. Nearly one in five people in the U.S. have a disability, and one in four households include, includes at least one person with a disability. That's a lot of New Hampshire voters out there who are supporting this bill. Um, let's see. And again, I'll just re-emphasize the importance. If you're an adult individual with a disability, this bill is very, very important to you or to them. Uh, workers with disabilities are more likely to be in a part-time, low-wage jobs that don't even offer basic benefits, much less paid family and medical leave. And two in three part-time workers with disabilities don't even have one sick day. So. 628 increases the economic opportunities um, as well as stability for these workers who are adults with disabilities um, so that they can be more self-sufficient. So when they need to care for themselves or a medical condition that comes up, they have the ability to do that. And I would say to you that HB 628, <coughs> um, that you can feel good about this. Okay, let's make a few tweaks, make sure that it's solvent and that the numbers add up but you can feel good because you, are, you would be empowering people to take personal responsibility to plan for these unique situations where you either have to care for yourself or a family member. So for those reasons, I urge you to please support the bill. I have testimony here as well. Deo Diné had to go pick up her son, Bodhi. Again, um, this youngster, uh, experiences spinal muscular atrophy, was uh, we call SMA, and they're fully in support. So I'll pass that around as well. I'm sorry, my copier ran out of copies this morning, but I have these very handy, succinct um, documents here from uh, the National Arc Association that um, helps to support policies that enable the self-sufficiency and independence of Americans with disabilities that speaks specifically to paid family leave and some of their stories and some of the facts that 
I hope you will seriously consider. Oh, um, do you have any questions? All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's been a long day. I guess. All right, so I'll pass you the. Good. Uh, Jerry Abbott, Associate General Contractor, so that's my position to you. Thank you, Chairman, uh, committee members. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I come before you today to maybe give you a little insight as running an association. I'm Gary Abbott. I run the Associated General Contractors. I'm the Executive Director. And we brought these kind of bills up many times. And I would say that the general reaction that I get, it's not like strongly opposed or support. It's the distrust that the, another government agency program in how it's going to work. Because some of the ones we've had have not gone so well. There's a little distrust there. But what I want to talk about is what the chairman talked about when he opened up the very beginning in the morning to talk about the insurance piece. That's really what the committee's about. We all understand insurance. People pay in, and then there's benefits. This bill has both what the benefits are and what the pay in is. The complication for your committee, which I, I think is kind of a very interesting, is insurance programs are great when it's inexpensive and you get great benefits. But when that starts not to work, it's not great. So I looked at this bill more of a technical from an insurance basis, and I think that's what your committee's challenge is. And I'm just going to highlight some of the, this is really set up not as a voluntary program because it's very difficult to opt out. Uh, if you read the language in the bill, you have to have a notarized submitted to the department and to the employer before they're hired. I can tell you as an employer, I have trouble getting their I-9 the first day of employment. This is not really a way that's going to be easy for businesses to do. That just stands out to be like, that's a problem. I haven't even had time to explain what the benefits are and what the costs are. Because the employees are paying for it. Now, recognize I represent an association of businesses. And I try to explain how this bill works. The other key pieces is some of the benefits. The benefits under the definition of family and medical leave means leave from work. Well, having a baby. You got up to 12 months after. It's probably not what the usual health care, other short-term disabilities. It's a pretty open. So the opportunity for benefits is great. I'm not going to argue with actuaries and the rest because they need to look at this. But I also think I came here today to protect the employees of the companies that I represent. This is a great program, maybe at this price. But it should be set up more like an insurance program. Maybe it's a calendar year program. You opt in every year, and you can opt out. The rates change, you can opt <coughs> in or opt out. It's the employee's money. It's their program if they want to be in. If it's not, if it's mandated, they have no choices in how this is structured. It really is in order to keep the low rate. Everybody's got to be in. I know that. That's why this is a very tricky situation because in order to, for me to protect the employees from cost controls that may or may not happen, it's a risk. I really need the opportunity that employees can opt out if the prices change or the deal changes or the benefits change or the plan changes. There's so much opportunity here. And then the other big thing is how the rates change, it's really left up to the legislature. Another bill's got to come in. You've got to change the rates through legislation. Huh. The opportunity for risk at the state level that you made a mistake could be hard, big. And this might not be like the employment security where employers got together and said, yeah, we'll raise these fees and we'll pay this higher amount. This is a fee on the individuals that are paying <coughs> It's great when it's a low price and great benefits. But you have to look at this whole thing. Waiting periods. The waiting period is six months. Most health care for maternity have a nine month. You don't join the program. It's already 
going to take the benefits without a nine month waiting period. But this program, you sign up uh, and it only takes six months before you're eligible. So the opportunity to take these benefits is much greater than many other programs. Um, I have a lot of questions when it comes to, uh, I have disability insurance for the employees that I, that I hire. And that can kick in sometimes before the baby is born. And it can kick in for way beyond the regular. So there's a lot of pieces in here if you really, and I think this is what happens with employers. If I bring this bill up, it glosses over because there's so many details in three or four pages. Um, I know insurance companies, it would be a lot more pages that I'd have to sign with all the conditions. So I have to think that not everything is really looked at from a insurance actuarial. And I think that's where you hear some business groups saying, I'm not sure that the costs are gonna stay, but once we start this thing, how it's drafted, you can't get out of it. You can't stop it. I don't even think the legislature could stop it because people have had paid in something. So I think the big choice is really upon you in this committee, and it's a big task. I mean, this is a this is something that really is a decision. I think you saw most of it, and I'm sorry, Representative Butler's still not here. He asked for suggestions. Well, suggestions is put in the waiting periods, give the employees the option to opt in and out. And you could do that. I'm going to throw another suggestion. Instead of this notarized thing, we could send a sheet like we do for employment security, like right now, but when we hire somebody, we have to send them a sheet of who's hired. Well, we could send them a sheet of who's opted out. That would be very simple so they know in that next quarter they're getting the money for that individual. Be very simple. Doesn't, but it would be a way for employees to opt in and out. So that section needs to be really looked at. So when I go to employers, I say, there's a lot of things here, and I don't know how they're going to work. And I don't know what the definitions of some of these are going to mean in the long run. And I think a lot of that needs to be worked out. Now, it may be great and successful, and terms and conditions may be the same, but I think if the rate stays low, as many people have promised, then you wouldn't have a problem with the opt-in and opt-out. <coughs> because it would be such a great deal that people would go in. But I also think as soon as you allow the opt-in and opt-out, I think the rates change. So I think this is a huge <coughs> choice and you're, I, I hate to say it, but this committee, if they're looking at the insurance piece, this is not a simple thing. Insurance companies spend a lot of money with actuaries and the rest to figure out what products to sell, what, what's in it, what exclusions are in it. You have a product. This is paid for by employees, you know, the citizens of New Hampshire. And I think you have to look at that. This is not a free thing, it's something. And, and I will even tell you this. I've gone to employees and said, what do you think? I have some employees who don't, not interested at all, would opt out. Now, oh, I want to point that out. There's nothing clear in the bill about my existing employees. It, it's not really clear. I know the intent by the sponsors is when it's implemented, they get the choice, but it's not clear in here. The language is not clear about the initial steps for, you know, if you have X hundred people, do you, what, what's the window of time and do you get that? The bill just needs to be clear. I know the intent of the sponsors. But I, I think when I go back to what I was saying is I've asked employees, and I know that some are answering. Some are saying they're not interested. Well, they've had their kids. They're not interested. I don't know what's going to happen there. Then there's others that haven't had their kids. They're interested. So I think you have to understand people are looking at it individually. And I think that, I'm really here today that this is a big choice. And really, have we looked at all the costs? Because you're the ones who are gonna make the costs continue for the waiting periods. And I don't see really enough of them in here to protect the program from ins and outs and abuse. With that, I would end my testimony and hope I kind of helped the committee along with you have a big challenge for you. You have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'm a little confused. You filled out the pink slip saying the Associated General Contractors are opposed to the bill. Because how it's drafted, I, I think everybody's in, and I don't have the choice for my employees to be out. Further question, anybody? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
the bill as written gives the option, it's, it's a voluntary program. They do not have to be. So why are you saying well, that it's all in? Make that, make that very clear and make it easy for them to opt out. And currently, it seems to make it as, you know, notary. Some small businesses, we don't have notaries within the office. I mean, I, I think employees, it says you can't coerce. I am saying that once you start this, you have to quit a company to opt out. <laughs> Just one more question, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are you stating that, um, it was stated earlier today, that businesses aren't, aren't uh, don't know what notaries are? Are you stating that No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's difficult for a new employee to get a notary, come to work for me, without either an opportunity, a window, a time frame. You have a notary in your own office. I do not. So you never have to get an notary. It's an unusual business. <laughs> I find my friendly little bank teller is Thank you very much. You're welcome. The chair will call on June Dustin. Thirty dollars. She was here, but her testimony, I believe, Amanda Sear submitted from the Portsmouth Chamber. Oh, right, right, okay. Okay. We want to get a bunch from Ms. Catholic. Nikki and Casey? Do we have any other already? Nikki, I believe. Was that? Nikki, I believe. Okay. All right. And then Julie Day, did I hear the ring? Yes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, my name is Julie Day. I'm from the New Hampshire Children's Trust, where they prevent child abuse chapter for the state of New Hampshire. Um, I will not read the whole testimony because you have it, and I think you guys are. <laughs> Um, but what I will say is the Center for the Study, the Center for the Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, tells us that policies that improve family-friendly work policies improve the balance between work and families while ensuring economic security. Issues such as livable wages, paid parental and sick leave, flexible and consistent schedules make it harder um, for families to succeed if they don't have these. Some potential outcomes if families do receive these benefits are improved improvements in children's health and potential um, development, reduction of child abuse and neglect, reduction of maternal depression, and parental stress. And we all know that when parents are stressed, then that causes a whole lot of havoc in the family, school, and community. Um, adverse childhood experience such as child abuse and neglect contribute to lifelong physical and behavioral issues. Um, a child is more likely to experience adverse childhood experiences when parents experience stress such as un- or underemployment. The paid medical leave um, would help this because it would allow parents to take time off without losing their job um, and be able to help their families in the meantime. The medical, and the family and medical leave bill, um, House Bill 628, establishes such a program here in New Hampshire and would help people caring for themselves and for family members without losing their financial security. So we urge you to vote yes on this bill. And the other sh sheet I gave you is from um, Prevent Child Abuse America, and it gives some statistics about how important it is um, for work and family policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Angela Harris. Good afternoon. Chairman Hunt, members of the committee, thank you for taking the time to hear my testimony. It's been a long day. 
and I'm going to try not to repeat anything that I've heard already. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'll try. Um, as a registered nurse for almost 20 years and, a hosp and over a decade as a hospice nurse, as well as having to take care of my own mom um, in the last five years of her life, uh, I, I am very familiar and fully empathize with the struggle there is to care for family members that are in need. Um, and the pressure that that puts on the family. Um, however, I have a lot of reservations with this bill. Um, initially, it appeared that this would be a purely opt-in safety net with monies taken only from those who choose to participate. But in reading the bill, we now know this isn't the case. In fact, it requires businesses to collect fees for taxes based on numbers of employees and their income. And employees must opt out instead of opting in like they would with other benefits. Uh, they have to jump through legal hoops in order to do this. And to me, in my mind, this makes it clear that this isn't really insurance, but a thinly veiled mandate or an income tax based on their income. I think this is horrible for businesses and all the things that they'll have to manage. Employees, it's going to put an extra burden. Um, but, it, but more importantly, I think it sets up a framework for future mandates that will only serve to saddle our children and future workers with an ever-increasing financial burden. Personally, I would like to see the state create an atmosphere that's more conducive to having insurance companies come up with affordable private plans. They already exist, as we've heard, and I think finding ways to tweak so that they're affordable for most workers. I mean, not, can we get everybody? Hopefully. Um, but I think that would be a more beneficial thing thing to pursue. So, I urge you to find the next meeting to legislation. Any questions? I think we're all questioned out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is Deborah of Mom? Mom, she's still? I don't see her. She's in the center. I don't know if Okay, that's right here. And Ellie is excellent. Good afternoon, you know, almost good evening. Card, nice. Sorry. Thank you very much for being so patient, being here all day, it's been a long day. I appreciate everyone on the committee, Chairman Hunt. So I, I oppose the bill. My name is Elliot Axelman, I live in Manchester. I represent myself. Full disclosure, I moved to New Hampshire from a state that we've spoken about it for a few speakers spoke about it in New York. I think they have FM FM live currently. Illinois. New York State has it, I believe. Um, I moved there here partially because there is no state income tax. I do see, like a few speakers mentioned, that this is a, a soft mandate that is a state income tax. There's currently an opt out in the current language. The opt out is not very easy. There are some hoops. Um, forcing someone to get a, a notary and a letter and a form, it's, it's a little bit of money, a little bit of time. It's still a mandate. If, if I trusted that government would not make this a more difficult opt-out or get rid of the opt-out and say, you know, it's insolvent, we have to make it mandatory. If I trusted that it would remain, maybe I would have slightly more compassion or sympathy for this bill, but I don't trust that, unfortunately. But speaking of it as, as an insurance, this, this is the Committee for uh, Commerce and Insurance, this, if there were really a need for uh, family medical leave insurance, the free market would provide it. There are so many insurances out there, so many different types of plans. I'm not an insurance expert. I've been in healthcare since 2011. I've had many, many types of insurances. I've been under my parents, under myself. I've had, um, my brother has supplemental insurances like Aflac and plenty of other competitors that pay you for injuries, diseases, uh, being at home. Now programs that pay you to take care of family members that some governments have. But this, and then I've heard some other people say that there are some rumors that there are no insurances that necessarily cover family medical leave insurance because I believe the New Hampshire State Department of Insurance forbids it. So that's another possibility. I, again, I don't know all those laws. I'm not an expert on that. I personally don't believe that any type of insurance should be forbidden. If a consensual adult consents with a contract with me in, here in America, it should be legal for us to make a contract regardless of the details. I think that if, if Mr. Smith wants to sell an insurance policy to me for $5 a month and that covers whatever the contract says, that should be legal. But I understand that the New Hampshire Department of Insurance <coughs> Other states forbid certain types of insurance plans from happening. If, if that's the case, if I'm wrong, then, then someone will let me know. Um, so there, I, I vaguely 
Yeah, okay, okay. Absolutely. I would know that too much. Okay. Um, a few more issues with the bill quickly before I finish. Um, it seems that language exempts the government employees from this program, so the authors and the supporters would say it's a good program. Like you've said with, with Obamacare and, and other government programs, if it's good, the government should want, would want in the program if, if it were a good program. A few other issues. This will be a government program that will cost, I believe the estimate was over $4 million, at least 40 new government employees. And as far as the numbers, we heard a few speakers today and from previous hearings mentioned that it's insolvent, and, and that was the estimates assume that 100% people will participate. <coughs> we already have all the state employees, all the government employees, which is a fair amount of employees opting out because they're not, they're exempt. And then people like me and others opting out who don't think they'll use it. So it's not 100%, meaning it's insolvent. Meaning either they'll have to mandate that it, it's a tax, we have to mandate participation, or it's a program that's become insolvent, like Social Security over the years, and it will eventually require some kind of bailout by taxpayers. And then I end up paying a whole lot of a big, big tax. Another, speaking of Social Security, I understand that this pool from the FMLI will be held by the government in some sense in a separate account. And, and I understand it's not in the, in the uh, general fund necessarily, but again, I wish I had more trust. I really do. I don't trust government to not tap into that eventually, like Social Security, Highway Trust Fund, and take money from that, and then we'll turn around and it's kind of insolvent or it's, or it's bankrupt. Um, some previous speakers mentioned accountability and personal responsibility. I actually kind of see it the opposite way. I think this bill would cause less personal responsibility. For instance, not every disease and injury is, is planned, of course. I've had bad injuries doing a lot of sports, and they're, they're not planned and they're horrible. But as far as pregnancies, it, it'll be planned for me. Other surgeries, my family has had plenty of uh, ambulatory surgeries. Those are planned. So th you can prepare for that. You can you have insurance, you leave work, or you get paid time off, which I've been lucky enough to approve over years. I've worked for plenty of years in healthcare, and I approved time off when I needed it. Um, and you have family help you, and you have you have these funds. And I have a few more notes here, and I'll be done. Um, the the uh, doctor from Dartmouth, the OBGYN, mentioned how important it is for uh, parents to bond, new mothers especially, to bond with new babies. I absolutely agree. I'm not an OBGYN, I'm a critical care paramedic, but I'm sure that's the truth. Mothers need to be with their babies, and I'm sure it's, it, there are a lot of issues if they're not with their babies in the first few months of life. But he also mentioned, which, which would counter that point, that he voluntarily, without government forcing him to, uh, created a, a fund, seemingly, an endowment fund, to help this to help this um, parents who can't be with their kids. And that's, again, proving that kind of voluntary action works. On that note, uh, Americans, without government forcing them, Americans give th over $370 billion a year in charity. I've given charity. I'm not even the most generous person. I've never had a lot of money. More than charity, I've, I've volunteered it in uh, EMS for over three years, like 30 to 40 hours a week volunteering. And people volunteer to look at charity. For programs like this, and, and I'll say right now, come up to me afterwards, I will volunteer my time. I'll donate some money that I have for mothers who really can't be with their kids because they have to work because they don't have the money, or people who, who get injured or diseases. So we, we can do it voluntarily without government. And a lot of people who, are, who uh, wrote this bill and support this bill make it seem like with, without this government program, people will, uh, so to speak, die in the streets, and people won't have any uh, recourse if they are to get sick or injured. It hasn't happened till now. There are bad cases. There are always bad cases. In, in my family, we've had cancers, massive injuries that put us out of work for a year. We've had bad diseases. Thankfully, I haven't had any major illnesses or, or massive injuries. I've had a bunch of injuries, but it happens, and people take care of each other. My brother was out of work for a year, and then again for 10 months. He broke his legs, and we took care of him. He had insurance. He had an insurance called Combine, which is like Aflac. And he was smart to have it because what, every bone you break, they pay you a few hundred dollars. It's a very simple insurance plan. It's like Aflac. And some, some companies offer it through their company. And, and I should probably have something like that. If I break my leg walking out of here, I'll get a few hundred dollars for every bone. I think a hundred dollars for being in the ER, um, $50 or a hundred dollars for each x-ray taken. So again, that's the personal responsibility as I see it. And furthermore, families. Families have responsibility. It's, it's cultural and it's culturally kind of conservative and some people disagree. I think families have a big responsibility. I, we take care of our families. When, if my parents need me, we'll take care of them. My girlfriend is doing unbelievable amounts for her parents, taking care of them. We take care of family, it is what it is. I, I don't want government getting involved with that stuff. As my father got sick, we'll take care of him. 
he'll take care of himself. We, we don't want a big government program. It would be so sad if this committee and the Labor Committee and if the pass of the House again, for, for these people to essentially go down in history as being responsible for setting the foundation for a state income tax in New Hampshire. Because a lot of people speak about we need to, as a state, draw in people to work here. Maybe people move here. This is the kind of thing that makes people move out of the state. I, I moved here, it, I looked around the whole country when I moved here, and I, I settled on New Hampshire in large part because of the great culture we have and the no income tax. I think it's fantastic. It's, it's great that we have no income tax and no sales tax. It's only us in Alaska with no income tax or sales tax. As we implement more taxes, it drives people away. New York has the highest taxes overall. They have the highest net negative migration in the country every year for, I believe, 10 years. So that's, that's my testimony. I'll take questions. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course. Anybody else would like to testify? You missed me. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why you were hanging around here. Because you know better. You got to fill out a pink card. I filled out a pink card. <laughs> you actually have two Dustins in there, so maybe you thought they were. I don't know what Thank you. I know. I thought I called you today. That was the other Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, here yeah. I am. Here you are. <laughs> My name is Sarah Matson Dustin. I'm the director of policy at the New Hampshire Women's Foundation, uh, which is a community foundation that invests in women and girls with grants to local community organizations as well as research and advocacy. We're in support of House Bill 628 for many of the same reasons that you've heard from physicians, from small and large businesses, uh, as well as from individual people who have been called on, as nearly all of us will during our lives, to be caregivers for their children, for their parents, or to recover from their own injury or illness. <coughs> Uh, but we don't just want to see this program on the books because we think it's a good idea. We want to see it succeed. So we are invested in the program being solvent and being sustainable. Uh, and we're supportive of tweaks that the committee might wish to make, whether that's going to 0.67 for the payroll deduction, going to six weeks. I am sure that you can find some middle ground between a notarized statement and a handwritten piece of paper in terms of the opt-out. And we would be supportive of those measures to make sure that the program can succeed the way we all want it to. Uh, I would just close by saying that I think New Hampshire Employment Security is really well positioned to administer this program. Uh, you heard Deputy Commissioner Labors describe the way in which our unemployment insurance trust fund was able to weather the Great Recession really pretty well, especially in comparison to a lot of other states. Uh, and that was through not only employers stepping up, but through employees giving a little bit. There's now a waiting week for unemployment insurance. So the suggestion that we might use the conservative estimates around 0.67 payroll deduction and six weeks, and then take a look at two years' worth of data and see whether or not there's room to move those up or down a little bit, I think those are really reasonable suggestions with an agency that is accustomed to doing this work and we have every reason to believe would run this program with integrity as well. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ms. Wilson, for your, for your testimony this afternoon, for your patience all day um, today. Um, uh, th there's been, in, in the last couple of hours, quite a bit of uh, testimony uh, yes, there concerning <laughs> right, sustainability. And um, I just wanted to get uh, back around to uh, what Ms. Dustin um, uh, talked about here. But uh, according to the New Hampshire um, uh, employment security data that was presented prior to lunch, um, is it my understanding that, um, that at a 0.67% premium, uh, all the way down to 70% 70 70 participation, and at an eight week, that that is in fact a sustainable program? Uh, so what I heard was, and certainly I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong, I heard 0.67 six weeks at 70% participation. Participation is where they feel confident in the solving Con Confident. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that was the public hearing on the House Bill 628. The subcommittee is scheduled for... A week from today, the 23rd. The 23rd at 9.15.
Uh, we have a very long blue list, so I'm not going to read it off. We'll take uh, a five-minute break here.